Welcome to the Royal Academy of Engineering uh, and to this um, briefing session which is being organised by the uh, UK Focus for Biomedical Engineering. I'm Tony Unsworth, I'm currently the Chair of the UK Focus for Biomedical Engineering of the Royal Academy uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here. We're absolutely chock-a-block full, we've had to turn people away today so this is a really good sign. Clearly a lot of people are interested in uh, regenerative medicine and that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by just looking at the programme that we've got today. Uh, the first three of these presentations are going to be related really to the academic input. So this is getting us into the position whereby we have the information to, to apply within either the industrial or the clinical setting. And the second part, the last three of these presentations, will be doing just that, applying the, te the technology to these various areas, both to the NHS and to the, to the clinical situation. Before we start, I just have a few domestic announcements. First of all, we are not expecting uh, a fire practice this afternoon. So if the fire alarm goes off, it's likely to be uh, a real one. So we go out of this door, we go down the stairs which are immediately outside this door, as to get to the ground floor, outside and cross the road and stand just by the little park across the road. I hope that won't happen, but that's just in case we need it. We all know, I think, where the toilets are. Turn right when you go out of this door, right again, right again, and they're on your right. So if you keep all right, you're okay. Um, <clears throat> so that'll find that. We are recording this. Uh, it's going to be, this particular afternoon is going to be recorded. It's being recorded as I speak now. And that will be shown on the, the Royal Academy of Engineering's TV uh, channel, which is RANG TV, which you can access from the homepage of the Royal Academy. So that will be there for people to see uh, after the meeting. So I tell you that so that uh, you're all aware that it's been, everything you say and do will be recorded. Uh, and will you please also, if you haven't already, either silenced or shut your uh, telephones off, please do so, because they do sometimes interfere with the uh, public address system. Having gone through all that, we'll now look at four questions which you saw on your sheet. There will be an examination on this at the end, so do <laughs> concentrate hard. These are the four questions we hope that this afternoon will answer for us. And they're really because regenerative medicine is very new. You'll have seen uh, quite a bit about it recently. It's the application, of course, of, of cell biology, molecular biology, and engineering principles. And we're trying to get really to grips with this and how we can get the very best out of this for patient care. And so these are some of the questions we'd like to, us to be thinking about. Is there a role for engineering in the translation of regenerative, regenerative medicine technologies into the clinic? And, and what do engineering and engin sorry, engineers and engineering do, need to do to fulfill this particular role? How might engineering need to adapt to apply its traditional systems, as you see here, uh, the systems approach to regenerative medicine, and the enablers and the policy changes that will be necessary? So these are the, these are the questions we want to answer by the end uh, of today. <clears throat> And to get the, the ball rolling, we have uh, Professor Chris Mason, who is going to talk to us, first of all, about biological functionality. And uh, Professor Chris Mason is, uh, is at University College London. He's co-director of the, uh, the London Regenerative Medicine Network, uh, and we look forward to hearing his talk now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have never seen such a misleading title to a talk in my life. <laughs> if you think for a moment I can tell you the NHS perspective on anything, far less regenerative medicine, uh, you're looking at the wrong man. However, um, I, listening to the talks that have gone previously, uh, I completely agree with a lot of the points they make. Um, I think it's an accurate summary of the world as it is. But what are we going to do about it? What options do we have to do anything about it? Uh, I find myself really enjoying today because actually I think I'm a rare beast in the NHS because I am an engineer. If only I had some more engineers to speak to in the NHS, we might better move this forward a bit more. So let's just take a, let's take a snapshot of where I think we are. Um, and basically I think most of these points have been made in the previous talks. Few products, 
focusing on skin cartilage where rejection is not so much an issue or that, that is being tackled by uh, august bodies. It's clinically led, it's focused generally on individual patients. This is not a commodity treatment yet. And maybe that's a clue as to one of the things we ought to be looking at. Research has come up many times. Uh, we are where we are largely because of research, but the technology strategy board is getting stuck in, so that might change. Uh, specialist centres, it's not an existing standard of care, high level of clinical and scientific expertise needed, and it's still, last, last example um, overlooked, still small quantities of products, so the manufacturing processes are easier to get a grip on. The classic example is what do we do now for chronic, uh, chronic wounds? Well, we all know what we do. It's all to do with uh, press, address press addressings, packaged products, um, community nurse visiting patients generally in their home. Um, it's, it's a treatment. It's a therapy. And somebody said earlier, uh, and there's another clue in what they said here, there's a, another clue that a therapy is not a cure. Someone who's being treated is a burden on the NHS pretty much until they either heal up or until they disappear out of the system for natural causes. A cure <laughs> takes that person out of the system. It may have a higher cost of cure, but I don't think the NHS has latched on to the actual overall costs and the savings that are there. Let's hold on to that thought. Compare and contrast that with uh, an engineered, a tissue engineered product. As I say, it's, it's a one-off, hopefully a cure. It's a high cost per patient, but they go away. It's wonderful. Um, high level of clinical care, care required. The savings come in the community side. And this is one of the challenges that uh, ever since I joined the NHS, everybody talks to me about, the silo budgeting aspect where the cost is felt here, but the benefit is felt over here. The two do not tie up. This person bears the cost, therefore they're not going to do it. That's one of our challenges. And of course there's this lovely thing called payment by results, uh, which is the tariff system, and I, it, it's, it's just seen as a barrier. Um, however, I don't actually believe that. I sit just across the floor from the Payment by Results team and I've had long discussions with them about this and they're saying, no, if you've got something new, bring it to us and we'll have an adult grown-up discussion about how we can change the system. So I'm not so, not so worried about that one. But the upshot is, as everybody else has demonstrated so far, there's a great deal of work still to be done in this area because it's new and new is good. One of the things that's happening is DBIS, um, sponsors of TSB, have got a thing called Office of Life Science. And they correctly, as somebody else has said, picked on the issue that we have got a leading industry here and we need to capitalise on it. And what they said they would do about it is to get the Technology Strategy Board to have it as one of their three new industries, main pillars, with, I've got 18 million as a RegMed progress, so I'm delighted to hear it's 21 and a half. Okay, well, we'll take that as, as cost and overhead. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so there's serious money here, to, supported by the TSB, uh, to look at commercial R&D, and that's a key word as well, commercial R&D, and the development of partnerships. The second thing they said is this stuff can develop, deliver uh, better care to patients um, and by looking at innovative products coming out of this sector. And one of the package of measures they put in place, they asked us, the National Innovation Centre, to run a series of what have unfortunately been called wouldn't it be great if workshops, which basically you go to the front line and you say, just complete this sentence, wouldn't it be great if what? What do you really need? that would enable you to deliver better patient care and hopefully have some economic impact to the healthcare system. And we ran five uh, sessions of those at the Expo in June that some of you may have gone to at the Excel Centre. And we looked at cardiology, urology, paediatrics, the ambulance services, interestingly, which is sort of Cinderella service in healthcare, and regenerative medicine. Now, the first four very much said, oh, we need a better this, or we need an improved one of those. The regenerative medicine one was structured slightly differently. 
and I'll share with you what the outcome of that was. Basically, it looked at the environment. Uh, it said, what have we got now? We've got world-class research and development. What, what are we facing? We're facing this tran translational gap with the, all these issues that are in the black frame, which I won't read out. And we're aiming at, our end point, is delivery of therapies, although we really mean cures, to identified patients. And we see three, three key stages to do this. Stage one is work out the clinical targets. Um, I, I'm coming from the point of view that we, to make this successful, we have to take the NHS and the Department of Health on a bit of a journey with us here. And in my experience in the Innovation Centre, nothing works better than actually showing somebody something. You can write all the papers you like, and they can be cross-vetted, they can be absolutely rock-solid, doesn't mean they're going to make a difference. You've got to do something, show somebody that it works, and then uh, they might actually accept that it's a good idea and help you do it. So step one, stage one, what clinical targets could perhaps we look at that we could create the business case to say to Department of Health or the NHS, look, if we could do this, and perhaps we think we can, look how much money it would save you out of the healthcare system. Yes, we've still got the silo budgeting issue. Yes, we've still got all the barriers that are there. But let's just show them the big picture stuff. Stage two is actually, well, when they've seen the business case, perhaps we've got to do it. And all the engineering challenges we've heard this afternoon about doing that. And stage three, the adoption route, getting it embedded into the service as the standard of care. So stage one. Um, we need to prioritise the areas of clinical need. In the Innovation Centre, we come from what is the need. Uh, it's no good inventing something and then finding who might want it. Start with a need and focus your energies on solving that problem. And this isn't just a healthcare problem, this is a business problem as well. Uh, the business problem is persuading someone to buy it. So the two things to do are to look at where the, the patient treatment offers the greatest healthcare benefit and where it offers the global NHS financial savings. And I propose an action. I propose that instead of um, put coming together and agreeing that everything's a problem, let's get a small team together, um, perhaps pre chaired by Professor Birchall, to actually look at this and identify and prioritise the patient needs. We will offer up a facility we have in the Innovation Centre of uh, supporting collaborations such as these work groups to uh, help this team do this work without necessarily having the diary management problem of let's all get together on Thursday the 3rd, or oh, I can't do that, it's my wife's birthday. We've, uh, we've got digital ways of doing this. We'll support the meetings, we'll offer to support the meetings um, perhaps with funding and doing the stakeholder engagement. Let's do something about it. It might not look like that, but it's a proposal. The second stage, the integration of technologies. Um, let's again bring together appropriate groupings of people to meet the challenges. Uh, I'm envisaging in the first group we will have the regulatory bodies, they are an issue, they do need to get their act together and they need to work with us, not stand over us and tell us what to do. So let's put a coordinated drive together to look at identifying, uh, meeting those clinical needs that we've looked at and agreed are important in stage one and again we'll do what we can to facilitate that, be it support of meetings, um, it, paying for rooms if we need them, bringing them together, whatever we need to do. And then the adoption route. Let's engineer a plan. Um, let's learn from experience. Let's actually pull this together. We're in Between the Innovation Centre, various bits of the NHS and the National Technology Adoption Centre, we've, we're building a body of evidence about how to bring new things to the NHS and promote uptake. Uh, we'll throw all of that experience and facilities behind this to make sure the things we've identified in stage one actually get into delivery in the healthcare system. And that's what I mean by do it. Show people that it works in practice. And that we find that gets a momentum all of its own and other people get on the bandwagon, get behind it. Now, there are a huge, totally agree with what everybody else has said, there are a huge number of, of issues, some of which are the adoption questions. 
And a lot of these adoption questions are exactly the same as faced by any other innovation that comes through the hubs or the centre. It's, does it work? Um, where's your evidence that it works? Is it a replacement or is it a step change? Well, I think we've all agreed this is clearly disruptive. What's the benefit to the patient and how do you quant quantify that in financial terms? Most importantly in the current environment and the future environment for the NHS, what's the benefit to the NHS system? Um, will it have a tariff impact? I think I've already shared my view that yes it will. How do we get it into service? Does it require? All these questions. Can we link it with existing DH policy? This is a big, uh, if you can do this, it's a big added bonus to getting this into service. Um, I suggest patient safety is probably a good one. Current theme in the NHS is a thing called QUIP, Quality, Innovation, Productivity and Prevention. Uh, so quality is obvious, it's patient benefit. Productivity is a shorthand way of saying, save us money. Uh, does it require a more or less skilled workforce? Well, it's a more skilled workforce up front, but hopefully as it becomes commoditised at the point of delivery, maybe not so. And what does it do to the patient pathway? This is another good way to embed innovations into the NHS. And what do I mean by patient pathway? Uh, this is an example. It uh, comes out of the 18-week group, but it's for knee pain. Now, it shows the, uh, the patient pathway as from first referral with GP through the system. And as you can see, it's quite complex. Lots of touch points, lots of, lots of decisions. But we will need something like this for whatever, whatever we choose in stage one to pick on as our high priorities. We will need to map its own patient pathway. And each one of those boxes up there represents an opportunity to engineer how it interfaces with the previous box, how it, inter how it interfaces with the post box. Do you actually need two or three boxes? Can you engineer a solution that does it in one? So apart from the therapy itself, there are process um, benefits to be had. The business process can be engineered from the outset, I would suggest, if we strike now, rather than having to fit it in around, well, this is how we do it at the moment, and can you, can you fit into that? So, question, can engineering concepts be applied to the patient pathway uh, approach? Yes, I know they can. We did it with 18 weeks. We've done it on several other areas. Um, let's not try modifying one that's there. Let's take the blank <coughs> piece of paper approach because this is a brand new tech, well, new to the NHS technology. We can do something good <coughs> if we work together and if we do it now. Uh, can we integrate with other parts of healthcare? This is worth thinking about. Is there something in diagnostics or imaging or telemedicine perhaps where we can be a force mul multiplier or value adder? Um, do we need to think perhaps about the supply chain aspects of RM? Uh, is the delivery of RM into the clinic an engineering challenge? So from everything we've heard today, yes, there are, there are opportunities for engineering in the delivery of the therapy or the cure, there are equal opportunities for business process re-engineering, for healthcare delivery re-engineering, for regulatory re-engineering uh, that I think we must not overlook, otherwise we're tack tackling these things piecemeal. Somebody put up a chart earlier that showed these things happening in parallel. That's essentially what we're suggesting. Oh, thank you very much everybody, I've reached the end. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm here to very much sort of set the scene and talk about the cellular aspects in relationship to the, to the engineering. I'm going to just briefly des describe why the cells are very different to other technologies we have, such as biopharmaceuticals. I'm going to discuss the medical management. It doesn't sound like it's relevant to the engineering, but I'll come to that. Stem cells regenerative to medicine, because that's what we're here for. Some proof of concept, so you can see that we're actually delivering the cells to patients successfully, and why there is a need, and a, and a need for early collaboration between the cell biologists, the scientists, and the engineers. You don't need telling, you're engineers. You understand that if you make a brighter and brighter candle, you never make a light bulb. And yet, this is very fundamental to what I want to talk about this afternoon. The fact is that small molecules, pharmaceuticals, Larger molecules, so-called biologics, made by the biotech industry, 
will never be a cell. A cell is a whole step change. It's a disruptive technology. And with that comes all the necessary infrastructure, and in this particular case, a lot of engineering challenges that we desperately need to, to, to sort out. Small molecules, I can draw a small molecule. The biopharmaceutical industry is very well established, very successful. You can draw an aspirin. If I was a scientist and I came up with this to the, for headache treatment, I can literally draw it and the, bio, and, the, and the pharmaceutical industry can manufacture it. No problems. Biotech, slightly more complex molecule. Much more complex, really. And it's really how you make it that determines the final product. But we can define it reasonably well, not as tightly as, say, an aspirin, but something like a recombinant protein or a monoclonal antibody, we can at least get some sort of handle on how to characterise it and how to manufacture it. But stem cells, tissue engineering, cell therapy, living cells, very hard to characterise. It's a bit like characterising me. You can say, yeah, OK, you know, not much hair, six foot tall. But that might apply to a number of other people in the audience. And yet that's how we characterise stem cells at the moment, very loosely, mainly on their appearance. That's quite different to biopharmaceuticals and pharmaceuticals. What do drugs do on the whole, the ones we've got? Well, they're medications for life. It's a nice business model for pharma. They very rarely cure. Now, I'm not going to include things like chemotherapy and antibiotics. But they control pain, and they manage blood pressure control and other symptoms. And they do a great job. And we all know insulin, the story of insulin, Banting and Best, and the cure of a girl or rather the treatment of a girl who was dying of insulin from the, from the early 20s. Three months later, she went from being emaciated to back to normal. Regular insulin requirement works very well as a therapy, but it's not a cure. And this is, in fact, what Banting said when he collected his Nobel Prize. Insulin is not a cure for diabetes. It is a therapy. Therapies don't cure, so you still get the complications of diabetes. And these are just two typical um, um, sort of ulcers that are, diabetics are very prone to getting. The only cure is a replacement pancreas. You need to put the cells back that you've lost, or at least the beta islet cells that you've lost that control the glucose level by regulating the amount of insulin. So regenerative medicine, what is it? Its simplest definition is that it replaces or regenerates human cells, tissues or organs. That's the important thing. It's all about cells to restore or establish normal function. Going back to normal, basically. We all know a repair when we see it. If you look in that definition, the word repair wasn't it. To replace or regenerate. A repair, and I've chosen this for engineers, this is a bicycle inner tube, obviously, which a patch has gone on. Is it as good as new? No, it isn't. And we have the same problem in our bodies. Scar tissue is a repair. It's not the same. The cells you get there are basically just filling the space. They're not regenerating the actual tissue. If we look at regenerative medicine, and I use this because we need to decide or understand what we're going to talk about this afternoon, we've got tissue engineered products, which are cells on structures. Cell therapies, cells on their own. We have got regenerative compounds. Erythropoietin, for example, regenerates the blood, red blood cells. It's a small molecule. It's rather, sorry, it's a biopharmaceutical. Biotech are great at making that. And we have regenerative scaffolds. The biomaterials guys are great at making those. And the area I'm going to focus on is the top two. They're all regenerative medicine, please note. But the top two are all about living cells as therapies. So just the top two. If we look at the spectrum of therapies that are available, we have small molecules, and as we go across, we get more and more complex, scaffold, cell therapy, and tissue engineering. And by and large, we can divide this up. Pharma is outstanding at small molecules and moving now more and more into biologics. The biotechs are great at biologics and looking at scaffolds because they sort of fit. And the regen industry, that's the industry that uses living cells as products, is very much involved with cell therapy <coughs> and tissue engineering. So the focus of this is about living cells as therapies. Lego bricks, good engineering stuff. But we basically are a pile of Lego bricks. Each one of us is around about 10 to the 13 cells. If you lose cells, there is no substitute for putting back cells. If you lose your arm, effectively you're losing 10 to the 12 cells, something like that. You need cells to put back. If you've got Parkinson's disease, you need cells to replace the dopaminergic cells that are lost. 
Not a question about putting in a small molecule. You can replace with that, but you can't cure. The tools that are available to us, or the materials, all cells are of use to regenerative medicine, be they adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells, or engineered cells of the future, things that's called induced pluripotent stem cells and tissue engineering, which I've mentioned earlier. The cells we use are from every stage of development, right the way through from a simple egg all the way through to the adult. And at every point, we can generate cells which are useful for regenerative medicine. No one cell will cure all. We will use different cells for different applications. Here we've got the better known ones, embryonic stem cells, adult stem cells from bone marrow, and adult cells which are 99.9% .9 of the bodies we have. I've reversed the order around and got adult stem cells on that side, and embryonic on this. This afternoon, you're going to hear a lot about therapeutic use. There is no doubt in terms of the range of diseases and orders, disorders that can be treated, embryonic stem cells are the most useful. In terms of scientific challenges, they are also the more, most challenging of them all. And in terms of commercial challenges, likewise. And again, others will cover those ground. But it's important to remember that there is a spectrum of cells available, and all of them are useful to us. What is a stem cell? In the broadest sense, it's a cell that can produce other cells of the body. It can differentiate into, in the case of embryonic cells, all the cells of our body, all 200 different cell types. It can also replicate itself, so it's got to have the capacity to replicate, to form more of the same stem cell, and the capacity to form other cells, such as a neuron. <coughs> we particularly like embryonic stem cells because, as I said, they come from the embryo stage and therefore can form all 200 cell types of the body. So in theory, we can produce anything. We don't always need to go back to an embryonic stem cell, and I'll show you a great example in a few moments of just that, where we've used an adult stem cell, which is already partly way down the differentiation process and is already on its way to forming just one or two cell types. But in theory, we can produce all the cells of the body and embryonic are, are immortal cells. We can make unlimited amounts, so good for scale-up. Do we know if the cells can actually cure patients? Well, I've said they're already building blocks of life. I've shown you that. Animal data, you have to take my word for it. I haven't got time, but there's lots and lots of great quality animal data. But what about proof of concept? And I'm going to dwell on that just very shortly. Bone marrow therapy, been around a long time, treated tens of thousands of patients. Nothing new about it. But remember, it is a stem cell therapy. Very successful. Been around since the 1960s. Take bone marrow to basically recover a patient who's had aggressive chemotherapy. But I want to talk to you about, just briefly as an example, using cells, and I want to illustrate the challenges of living material for limbal cell therapy. This is from uh, Judy Daniels at Moorfields Eye Hospital. This is a patient who's got an alkali burn to the eye. It's burnt off the clear layer, but at the same time burnt off the stem cells that would normally regenerate that clear layer. So when we rub our eyes, we lose a few cells, and the stem cells recover it. This particular patient has burnt the front off and lost the stem cells. This is so blind, pretty unattractive, but incredibly painful. The only treatment is a glass eye. So these are young people, typically. And this was the therapy until about five, ten years ago. It was a glass eye. Today, we can very carefully take cells from the good eye. They reside in the 6 and 12 o'clock position. And this is a small video of taking the cells. Why is it important? This is part of the bioprocess. It's part of the engineering. I'm sure everyone in this room can appreciate that the surgeon, however careful, will take different sized biopsies. That means you have different sized cells. He may crush the sample. This is an engineering challenge to get a high quality biopsy that delivers cells to the bioprocessor. This is the beginning of the bioprocessing of a regenerative medicine therapy. The way it works is that the cells are taken. They're very carefully extracted from the piece of tissue that was taken, expanded up in culture, grown for two to three weeks, and then, grew up, then actually put on the inside of a contact lens. The scar tissue is cut off and the, and the contact lens is actually stitched to the surface of the eye where the stem cells then migrate in. These have got to be high quality living cells. They've got to be of the cell type you want, so high purity is very important. And you don't want a load of dead cells. These need to be live cells of the right time, delivered at the right price. 
and this is the simple GMP unit, and others will talk about it, how they're made. It's all about creating an industry. This afternoon, I think the engineering answers many of the challenges of translation, creating a global industry. We need to do it in a reasonable time scale. It's got to be profitable, it's got to be sustainable. But what does that really mean? It means developing safe, effective and affordable therapies at volume for routine clinical practice. We don't want to treat just one or two patients. The unit I showed you at Moorfields treats about five to ten patients a year. That's its maximum throughput. If we want to treat things like heart failure, diabetes and other diseases which affect millions of patients, that is not the way forward. So, stem cells are all about cure, not just manage signs and symptoms. It's a paradigm shift. Christopher Reeve, wheelchair, step change. And where we're going is that we're looking to find genuine cures for these disorders and diseases. We have a challenge. There is a lot of high quality cell biology science out there. The science is definitely coming good. Hence the big guy and the big word science. The engineering, commercial translation is lagging behind at this moment in time. We don't want to take money away from science but we need to get something on the other side of this balance so that we can actually get these great, this great science into routine clinical practice. And I would urge that when we have our discussions later on, we talk about not whether we should collaborate, but how we collaborate early. This is typical of biopharmaceuticals. You do the discovery, you find the molecule. Maybe it takes you five to ten years. You then do the engineering translation, another five to ten years. The patents have run out, Everyone's lost patience. The way that this is now beginning to come forward, the regenerative medicine sector, is that we're very much doing the research and the translation as one, because the cells are the actual product. The process and product are absolutely inseparable. I hope that gives you some idea of where we're going in terms of the cell side and sets us up for this afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm afraid it's going to start getting down to earth. Um, I'm a production engineer, and we production engineers have to get down and dirty and sometimes get our hands back. Um, so manufacturing and regenerative medicine. What I'm going to do is go through a hint of background and then a, some, some facts and then some more vocabulary to allow us to have some, some open discussion later on. So we've already seen Chris's definition of, of regen med. That's a very clinically-led, a very functionally-led, application-led definition. If you look into the North American literature, you begin to see the second one, which hints at the kind of language that, that John was using. John was using the language of the, the, the mechanisms, the, science, the underlying science of the process. You do, you'll have figured out by now, need to have one or two bits of, of, of biological vocabulary. Perhaps the only two bits you do need is to understand the difference difference between allogeneic therapies, which are for everybody, and autologous therapies, which are just for yourself, because that has a significant difference, uh, makes a significant difference to the manufacturing process and the business model. Now, me, as a production engineer, I'm afraid whatever my definition of, of regenerative medicine is, is that of the regulator, because the regulator defines the process by which I have to introduce the product. So I don't have the luxury of making my own definition. I have to follow that of the regulator. As Tony said, a while ago we took a, a wheelbarrow load of money off the government to do some work in manufacturing of regenerative medicine products. This is the slide we used to kick off the presentation. Um, early tissue engineering experiences the products began to work. They, they, they hinted at, at considerable product promise. But unfortunately, they were hard to make. They were expensive to make. You couldn't move them around. Um, production staff was a bit of an issue. Um, effective manufacturing was a killer to those early <laughs> therapeutics. Um, we heard Michael repeat that this morning for us to, to ensure its currency. One of the things we should say now is talk a little tiny bit about that regulator. The regulator requires manufacturing to be done under GMP, what they call good manufacturing practice. All that is is say what you're going to do, write it down, do it, show you've done it, 
and do that again and again and again and again. So that you make the product in the same way as a product that went through clinical trials. Now, one or two of you have got bad backs that are here. You could have an intervertebral disc therapy made by that process somewhere in Germany. Now, clearly, those of you who know production engineers will know that is anathema because it's full of people. Now, people are extremely bad at doing this again and again and again stuff. Similarly, this was a picture of a facility built in the UK doing a um, cosmetic therapy which has got a great big clean room. Great big clean rooms are very, very expensive. And if you notice, putting the tops on the little bottles can be a bit tricky. Now, if that was your therapeutic, that's a GMP error. That is, shut the factory down, start again, do not pass go, get five, forty-six million dollars. Um, so this is one of the issues, the, the automation of these processes, the bringing of these processes uh, under control is very, very important. That was a major pro, pro, uh, focus of the Remedy project. In Remedy, we worked with the Automation Partnership, funded by the accused Richard Archer at the front. Um, with the Automation Partnership, we specified a, an automated production system that could go into a regular laboratory that wasn't necessarily affordable. Um, you didn't have to be a very large ph pharmaceutical company to be able to afford this, this production system. And we threw it at some interesting cell types. Um, one of the first things we did was think about what we did on this machine. We applied good old-fashioned engineering systems analysis techniques to figure out what the key process variables were and which, which, which things we should really tackle. Once we've done that, we started to measure the output of the process. So here's some processes carried out in my labs um, by the best team of postdocs we could put together and by an automated production system, demonstrating the automated production system is a lot better at making things consistently than a, a bunch of postdocs. As a process engineer, I, uh, I know that I, one of the things I have to demonstrate is that I can move the mean of a process. Um, so very, very important to say, let's measure what we're doing, let's automate what we're doing, let's understand what the machines are good for and what the people are good for, just the same way as we have always been doing. To Chris's point on collaboration, so we've, we've hit some very hard cell types, a bunch of clunky mechanical engineers from a technical university somewhere in the Midlands have, have automatically cultured human embryonic stem cells with a great team and a few very important mates. Um, but this is demonstrating that we've cultured human embryonic stem cells and differentiated them into cardiomyocytes. That is very, very important because cardiomyocytes are very important to those of us with heart disease and they're very, very good for drug test. So again, demonstrating that you can culture these things in volume and they are the same to your extremely demanding embryologists. So if Lorraine says they're all right, they probably are all right. But you notice we're measuring lots of things like karyotype, which you don't usually measure in an engineering laboratory. So it's kind of hinting that, that the things we have to do, we have to extend the relationships that we have to work on. Um, similarly... It's no good me as a production engineer working in isolation in an academic laboratory. I have to work with business. I ain't good enough if I, if I don't do that. And again, this is demonstrating that we can culture the Reneuron stem cell therapeutic, which is targeted at stroke, demonstrating that we are automating what the biologist does. We are reducing to practice the biologist's green fingers. Very, very important to understand that. <coughs> We also worked in the very early days on the culture of human mesenchymal stem cells. Those are the things that Chris mentioned about uh, that are in bone marrow. They are one of the very, very early therapeutics that will come to market. And again, the boys and girls, we, uh, we got them to culture um, mesenchymal stem cells. But more importantly, we demonstrated that in culturing human mesenchymal stem cells and getting the process right, you can apply Taguchi experiments where you look at more than one variable at a time. Biologists don't do that. Biologists ask 
ask the, the natural world one question at a time. We engineers tend to ask the natural world uh, a few questions at once, but in a very, very constrained and usually financially important marketplace. So just a hint to say, OK, we're bringing some of our tools to the biologists, the automation and process engineering, to assist the biologists to, to realise the therapeutics. John's begun to hint that uh, in the three-dimensional world, it's all a bit harder. Those were two-dimensional cell culture problems. Um, we've also worked with a, a company called Intercytex. Intercytex make a very smart skin product that, is, uh, that uses human cells to generate a natural human uh, scaffold, and we threw a process engineer at it. Jasmine Key used to work for London Underground, then for ICI Paints, and she's a card-carrying process engineer. And Jasmine's task was essentially to improve the mechanical properties of their product. And she did that using mechanical stimulation. Back to John's, uh, John's instances. These are all examples of where engineers can cross into these other fields to assist the, uh, the product developers to, to generate uh, new, uh, new solutions. Um, this is where it all gets a bit trickier. Poor May is in the audience. May fights this machine. Um, this is a machine for, for emulating the, the force system that you get in, the, in your intervertebral disc um, to see whether, as John has hinted, we can put cells into the intervertebral disc that differentiate to the right kind of cell type in the right kind of environment because intervertebral disc is one of the benchmark um, applications for, for tissue engineering. Now, the point that this, this makes very strongly to, to May and I is that working with the, automa the automation partnership, the automation partnership had a proven, evolving, uh, candle-like machine, uh, which was proven already, this is the, the jump between the candle and the light bulb, getting reliable systems that are a uh, step change is very, very problematic, and we will have to get things a lot more reliable before we can use them in conventional manufacturing. A bit of a task for us mechanical engineers. This is a great piece of work. I'm very, very proud of this. Nikolai Nikolaev is, is our physicist, so we engineers are will happily use the resources of physicists. Nikolai has done a piece of work which, which models the growth of a little piece of cartilage inside a rotating bioreactor. Nikolai's model includes all these <coughs> different things. Each of these is a complex physical submodel that is integrated to give numerically reasonable models of that growing um, product. Putting numbers on this stuff is our task um, and the engineers and the physicists working with our biological co colleagues who can challenge our engineering assumptions, mm -hmm. challenge our simulations. So Bogdan Obradovich from MIT and then Serbia worked with us, worked with Nikolai to ensure and validate that that model. It's got numbers on it, those are validated models. I think that's a real a uh, place that we can make a significant contribution uh, working with our biological and clinical colleagues to model what's going on. Somebody said, biology has no mathematics. It's probably only got computational models. Um, integrating computational models and mathematics to, to, to kind of emulate the mathematics is the language of physics. Perhaps computational models are the language of biology. A great, I know, a significant contribution that we, we in the engineering community can make. That's the techie stuff. Let's get a bit softer for a few minutes. We've already hinted that uh, this, is, this is about creating an industry base. It's not about doing some great technology in, in, in universities. It's about the one-to-many translation task. It's not about one patient. It's about many, many patients. To do that, unfortunately, you need an industry... Um, as, as Richard has implied already, that, that the task of, of uh, um, growing a business is a huge game of snakes and ladders. If you're a startup SME, not only do you have to get your product right, not only do you have to deliver to your, your, uh, your growing organisation, you have to give the guys who gave you the money something back. And that's the cool issue that, that, that takes so long. So the companies are busy doing that, 
uh, while we're trying to grow an industry. We've had quite a lot of discussion over the last few years about what are the key factors that influence that industry. Products in the market, products curing people for Brian is, is the thing that will really add the value. In order to get there, we have to have product technology, we have to have the kind of clunky process technology. We have, we've begun to hint that we need to have regulation that suits us. Regulation is slowly, slowly, slowly getting firmer. As soon as I understand what my regulation is, I can understand how much it's going to cost me to get to market. I then also need to understand how I'm going to make money from that market. And that's defined by the reimburser. That's the person in the marketplace who's willing to pay. So there are two sums. There's, there's a simple sum to do. How much is it going to cost to get there? How much are they going to pay when we get there? Reimbursement is very problematic. Reimbursement is one of the areas we need to think about very hard. Reimbursement is not decoupled with, with the, uh, between understanding where the company business model works and how the guys are giving you the money expect to take the money out. So there are always saying there are four uncertainties. The uncertainties of the technology, the uncertainty of the regulation, the uncertainty of the reimbursement, um, and the uncertainty of the financial uh, proposition between the business and its investors. Clearly, the thing that will make that happen is people, one or two ambitious, visionary people are pushing this industry along. One of the things we have to be very clear of on those four trajectories, those four uncertainties, are uh, what are the endpoints now for business? It's pretty clear that a trade sale is very important, but for Brian, it's that evidence of, of viable uh, of healthcare value. The thing that will constrain the growth of the business is if Brian gets his value quickly enough. Um, one of the things we have to understand as a business, the engineers are quite good at running businesses, they've been doing it for a while, is understanding how, how we accumulate value as we go down those trajectories. One more piece of philosophy that I'll close. In this world, there are three groups of stakeholders. Typically, there are entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs want to get their skates on, they want to make some money rather quickly. There are two significant parts of public policy that affect the growth of this industry. We've already talked about the regulator. The regulator is protecting the interests of the patient. They are not releasing a, a, a product that is not safe. The other part of public policy is the reimburser, the payer. Now, public policy would rather like to measure everything i rather like to know how much it's going to cost, what its side effects are. The entrepreneur would really prefer to measure as little as possible. So one of the things we recognise is that actually there are two very significant negotiated processes going on about what are you going to measure to demonstrate your effectiveness and what are you going to demonstrate to measure your cost effectiveness. Um, I think that the scientific community has a particular role to help these guys work out how are they going to know success when they see it. What is the uh, minimum measurement acceptable to the regulator? What is the maximum measurement acceptable to the entrepreneur? A significant um, place to interact. Like John, I'd like to thank our funders and I'd also like to thank our industrial collaborators. Notice that one of the things we've done, these two guys are North American companies, just making sure that the North American companies feel the same pain that we do in the UK. Um, and thanks to the team, the broader Remedy team and the broader Lacra team. Thank you. My brief was to talk to you a little bit about scaffolds and, and their importance from a functionality pers uh, point of view. And I think to give an engineer's perspective as to how we as a community can contribute to um, uh, challenges in regenerative medicine. 
Uh, I turn to the Technology Strategy Board definition for regenerative medicine, which is probably broader than some, which says essentially these are therapies that support or enable the body's own repair. And of course, you've probably heard already the key three elements of regenerative medicine are, of course, the cells or the stem cells themselves, uh, the molecular drivers or the signals that stimulate the cells to behave in particular ways, and what I'll be talking about are the scaffolds or the architecture that the cell cells can uh, sit in in the body. And I guess in terms of cells, we have to recognise there are different sources of cells, of course. There are always the patient's own cells, and that's one particular aspect I'll be talking about in terms of when we put scaffolds in the body, we can harness the patient's own cells and stem cells for internal repair. Or we can take cells out of the patient interoperatively and then uh, uh, re-implant them back in, so an interoperative uh, treatment. Or, of course, we can get cells from other patients, from other sources, from the point of view of banks. So there are many uh, different ways in which we can address the need for the cells. As I say, my particular uh, perspective is, is to deal with the scaffolds in this particular session today. I'd just like to step back and, and, and give you my perspective on engineering research. I think traditionally as engineers, uh, we've, we've, we've taken the broad perspective that engineering research is the application of physical science to address problems of global significance. I think as a multidisciplinary or medical engineer, I would take a slightly broad perspective and have done for many years, and that is in terms of the application of the broad base of science, both biological and physical science, and the knowledge in that science base, and, and applying that to address global clinical needs. And today we're talking specifically about those clinical needs in terms of regenerative medicine. And in this slide at the left-hand side at the bottom, some of the engineering research capabilities that we can bring design, in particular bioengineering design, uh, biomechanics and simulation, biomater biomaterials, bioprocessing, biomanufacturing, metrology and modelling. Those terms are indeed uh, terms that we're all familiar with as um, engineers. I always think when you're trying to address strategic need, you need to talk about your own internal capability and you've got to think about the external opportunity on the other side of the coin. And here we look at the clinical, market, clinical needs and the market needs. Of course, we're all an ageing population. I've been talking this morning on television about 50 more active years after 50. So if you're like me and just turned your, uh, into the second 50 years of your life, hopefully we will all have um, high quality active li lifestyles. And particularly this is an issue when we're looking at... Uh, elements of our body, such as the musculoskeletal system, our bones and joints, or the cardiovascular system. Because, of course, these systems naturally age and degenerate with time. And we've got to think about durable interventions of different forms which are going to enhance the quality of our lives, of our patients' lives, in the second 50 years of their lifetime. And what I'm going to talk about is the potential of scaffolds with regenerative potential. So why are scaffolds so important in regenerative medicine from my perspective? Well of course there are a number of biological therapies where stem cells alone or molecular drivers are sufficient to deliver the treatment and I'm sure Chris has been talking about those <laughs> stem cell therapies earlier uh, in this session. However, for functional tissue regeneration applications, scaffolds may also be needed. And examples of what we call functional tissue regenerations include the musculoskeletal system, the bones, the joints, the ligaments, the tendons, the cardiovascular system, the heart valves, the blood vessels, the skin and bladder are just some examples of functional tissue engineering. And of course, we all know, we're all familiar with our natural knee joint. And you can see in this slide a number of different tissues which will age and degrade with time. Um, for example, the natural cartilage on the surface of the bone ends, the uh, meniscus cartilage, uh, uh, the ligaments, the tendons, and indeed the bone itself. So even in the knee joint, we can focus on a number of really important uh, tissues that are gradually degenerating and degrading with time in which regenerative medicine has the potential to address that. 
and this is just a further uh, uh, slide showing the, 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 some of these tissues in more, more, more detail. So, what is the function of a scaffold and why is a scaffold so important in regenerative medicine? And this might be a, a, an engineer's perspective. Of course, for any of these functional tissues, we can think about the traditional biomechanical structure and function in both the short and the long term. Cartilage in the joints need to transmit loads and lubricate the motions of the joint. Ligaments and tendons need to transmit very high functions. Blood vessels need to retain arterial pressure. So that macroscopic stru structure and function is evident in the natural tissues and in regenerative and the need for regenerative tissues. My, my second perspective is the scaffold also provides the appropriate environment for tissue repair. The scaffold can attract and support stem cell tissue regeneration from the patient's own stem cells. And particularly, it provides a microscale, at a cellular level, a microscale environment, a physical and chemical architecture in which the, the potential of the regenerative cells can live and exist. So that's the second important function. The third important function is to think about the tissue structure in terms of the architecture. Because the scaffold converts the macroscopic biomechanical forces which are applied to structures such as ligaments and tendons. And it converts those forces into the appropriate cellular level, the micro scale or mesoscale level strains, which will actually stimulate the cells to differentiate down particular pathways and therefore form the appropriate form of tissue regeneration. So when we're talking about an appropriate scaffold, we've got to talk about the bulk mechanical properties, but we've also got to look at the structure of the scaffold and how it deforms at the microscale level. And of course, the scaffold on its own provides a much lower cost solution, regenerative solution in some patients by, re by recruiting and harnessing the patient's own cells. Of course, scaffolds can be used also in conjunction with stem cells from other sources and indeed can be used by, alongside molecular drivers. One of the key things to realise that when you're considering sc scaffolds in regenerative medicine is that every single tissue application has its own unique tissue architecture. And so, by definition, we need a very different scaffold architecture and structure for a piece of skin, for a blood vessel, for a heart valve, for a ligament, for a piece of bone and a piece of cartilage. You cannot have a single biological or synthetic scaffold for all these different applications. So tissue-specific architectures are required in each of the scaffolds. Not only to deliver the appropriate bulk mechanical properties, but to provide the un unique multi-scale composite structure and the unique physical and biological environment, and also these very important unique cellular level, mesoscale architecture and micro strain fields to stimulate the cells in the appropriate fashion. So this is just a very simple diagram. I guess it's the sort of diagram I'd show to my first year engineering students, which tries to illustrate just how important it is to be able to convert the bulk mechanical transmission of forces into the appropriate microscale strain fields. So you could consider the piece of, of tissue on the left-hand side just as a piece of ligament that's being stretched. And then if you look within the architecture of the ligament, you will see that it's got a particular structure of collagen fibres. And it is the cells that sit within that particular structure that actually get deformed and receive particular strain fields. But for those cells to sense and see that particular micro strain field, we have to have scaffolds with the particular and appropriate form of architecture to convert the macroscopic stress fields to the local cellular level strain fields. And so for each one of these tissues, whether it's a ligament, whether it's a piece of cartilage, whether it's a blood vessel, whether it's a heart valve, we need a very different scaffold architecture to deliver that mechanical transduction from the bulk level, from the macro scale to the micro scale. And that's clearly one area where engineers come to the fore. 
So, of course, there are many examples of scaffolds, and scaffolds can be presented in broad terms. They can be presented as synthetic or artificial scaffolds, which might uh, uh, actually degenerate over time in the body and remodel, or they can be of biological origins. But remember, each of these scaffolds has to have a very specific and unique multiscale architecture. Currently, I would say that synthetic scaffolds are not able to provide the required distinctive multiscale structure and architecture and function that are required. Although there is lots of effort and lots of uh, approaches to synthetic scaffolds which are under development. But there is an alternative. The alternative actually is Mother Nature. And that's what I just want to spend a few minutes talking to you about today, which is partly the type of work that we do. In fact, no Mother Nature has provided in our natural tissues, if you like, the perfect biological scaffold. And so I'm going to describe to you some technologies that we've developed that's able, that is able to produce biological scaffolds, scaffolds of biological origin with the appropriate architecture and function, which can be delivered as scaffolds with regenerative potential. So if you will indulge me for just a few more slides. The D-cell technology is a commercial train name for a set of biological scaffolds which harness uh, if you like, the power of nature. They utilise naturally occurring tissues, whether they be of an animal form or a human form. They are processed by a biological process which removes the native cells from the tissues and also removes the immunologically active molecules in, in the natural tissue scaffold. But what they retain is a biological scaffold with the appropriate multiscale architecture. So when you put... Uh, a, a ligament through this process, you get a biological scaffold that is ligament-like at the end. If you put a blood vessel through this, you get a blood vessel scaffold that is blood vessel-like at the end. And so forth, we can go on. If we put a piece of bone and cartilage through this, again, we have the right architecture for each of the specific applications. They retain the bulk mechanical properties with relatively small modifications. But more importantly, they retain that cellular level environment which induce local strain fields, appropriate local strain fields on the cells. And we've demonstrated in a number of situations that they are able to readily repopulate with the patient's own cells and indeed with stem cells. And some of these scaffolds provide a very simple regulatory pathway in, to the clinical application, which I will demonstrate to you, which means actually the cost of these types of approaches can be much less than some of the uh, cell therapies that are around. So we're trying to harness the patient's own cells and take a form of self-regeneration by providing the right environment in the scaffold. So let me talk you through a few examples. These are some histology slides. On the top is a histology section of the, uh, of, of the aorta, the, the wall of the aorta, with the tissue with the cells within the tissue structure. Below that is the decellularized matrix scaffold with the, with the cells removed. On the right hand side at the top is an aortic valve leaflet. Again, you see the complex trilaminate structure of the tissue architecture. We can take it through our bioprocess and produce a, a biological scaffold, a decellularized leaflet, which has very similar architecture and structure to that of the native valve but has no cells in it and has no uh, uh, immunological remnants left in it. If we do functional testing on a natural valve, a fresh valve on the left hand side and on a decellularized valve or scaffold on the right hand side, we can see actually the function of the heart valve is very similar. That means when you put this heart valve into a patient actually what you have is a, sc is a scaffold that is functioning very much like the natural valve in that patient, but with the potential to repopulate and regenerate with the patient's own cells. This is one of our technologies that we've actually translated into the clinic. This is a study that was published just this year in the Journal of Heart Valve Disease. It was using a decellularized valve technology for pulmonary valve um, replacement in what's called a Ross operation. This is a study that's been published from collaborators in Brazil 
And I just want to highlight to you at four years, the red line on the top with uh, 40 patients with the D-cell technology has a 100% success rate compared with other interventions in this particular group of patients. Now in this case, these were patients which were typically uh, young adults. And the scaffold for this particular series was from human origin. So we were taking uh, uh, donor human valves and bioprocessing them in a way that uh, uh, has very, very little resistance or risk in, in, in terms of uh, what we're introducing into the clinic. But we can extend this technology further. This is a, uh, a study of a, um, a vascular patch that we've been taking through in vivo studies. And here we see the repopulation of a vascular patch on a blood vessel uh, with the patient's own cells. That's the, 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 dark, the darker dots on, on the screen, sir. So that's a decellularized piece of blood vessel that's put on the blood vessel as a patch and then repopulating in the patient. Um, if we want to look to the musculoskeletal system, we can take similar approaches with tissues such as meniscus or indeed with ligaments and tendon. This is some work that we published in terms of approaches to, to biological scaffolds for meniscus where we've shown at the bottom the, the removal of cells and cell fragments from, in this case, porcine meniscus and an and animal uh, biological scaffold, which can then be re-implanted uh, into, the, into the patient. And we can do mechanical or biomechanical tests on this. And this is just a simple indentation test. Remember, the meniscus is essentially a piece of floating cartilage in your knee. And here we're comparing the indentation or the deformation of the meniscus and the biological scaffold over a period of time in terms of measuring its biphasic time-dependent mechanical properties. And you see, yes, there is a small change in those mechanical properties, but what we're getting here is a piece of meniscus whose, whose properties very closely match that of the natural meniscus. And that's really important for a load-bearing tissue such as the meniscus in the knee. And then if we look at uh, scaffolds for ligament or tendon reconstruction, this is another example uh, here. This is the uh, a section through the ligamentous uh, tissue. And here we're doing an experiment in the laboratory where we're seeding tenocytes onto the surface of the uh, biological scaffold. The fibres are lined up in this direction. Uh, this has to take you through 90 degrees. But you see that at one week in this in vitro experiment, the cells are still sitting on the surface. And then after three weeks, we start to see the cells entering the, uh, the uh, biological scaffold and be starting to behave like ligamentous cells. And we've also shown this work in, in small animal studies. What's really important in this is if you simply take that biological scaffold, and I hope this will appear to the engineers in the room, if you take that biological scaffold and do that experiment in the laboratory in static organ culture, then in fact the cells may go into the biological scaffold, but they remodel the tissue and create a form of fibrous tissue. If you do the same experiment and simply strain the biological scaffold at the appropriate strain level that the tissue will see in the body, then the cells go into that scaffold. They behave like tenocytes or ligamentous tissues and remodel <coughs> the tissue in the appropriate way. And we can do similar types of experiments with stem cells and show that by presenting the right type of Microscale mechanical environment and strains, you can differentiate the stem cells down the appropriate pathways. And that's a really nice experiment that shows that it's the relationship between the biology, the cells, the mechanics at the micro scale level that you only produce if you have the appropriate biological scaffold and micro scale architecture. Because with other forms of scaffolds which don't replicate, the architecture of the natural ligament, you will not produce the right environment to produce the differentiation of the cells. So that's another example in this case uh, using a decellularized ligament scaffold.
So that's just three or four examples. This, this slide just shows some of the uh, research innovation pipeline, showing the different stages that uh, uh, we've got to. Some of these are from biological scaffolds of human source, and some of them are from animal source. And we see at the bottom there uh, decellularized uh, skin, which is being introduced into the clinic by the National Blood and Tissue Transplant Service. I've talked to you about the Brazilian experience with, uh, uh, with the uh, allogeneic heart valve scaffold. Uh, we look at the vascular patch that lends itself to commercialization so we can produce products from animal sources and, and essentially sell them as a commercial product and some of the other uh, uh, applications that are currently in development whether they are in basic research, proof of concept and moving into development or indeed here with the osteochondral graft which is a combination of the bone and the cartilage which is put through similar processes. So it is truly a platform technology. It particularly lends itself to two-dimensional tissues. It particularly lends itself to, to, to soft tissues, although we are developing it now in terms of uh, approaches to, to bone and cartilage or bone and ligament grafts. So this was about engineering, and we talk about engineering solutions for the ageing population, particularly this concept of us living for 50 more active years after 50, and particularly about uh, 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 the quality of our lives as we get older. I think the question was, how do engineers contribute to this emerging field? It is an emerging field, and I take you back to my definition of engineering. The application of multidisciplinary science, not physical science, but multidisciplinary science, to address global issues, global challenges. In this case, the clinical needs in regenerative medicine, focused on the ageing population. And at the bottom of the slide, I've just highlighted some of the engineering functions that we can contribute to addressing some of these significant challenges, whether they be associated with bioengineering, biomechanics, design, simulation, modelling, uh, biomaterials, bioprocessing, manufacturing, we're going to hear about shortly, measurement, quality regulation, value engineering, and trials and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to talk without acknowledging the support of our sponsors thank you very much mm -hmm. I must come to engineers more often. <laughs> this just didn't never. This just never happens in, in the National Health Service. But, uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I, and uh, I, I will try and try and keep this fairly fairly snappy, really. Um, after all, it. Uh, I, and I am convinced actually that this is the easy bit. That uh, actually getting things from bench to bedside must be the easy bit. Faced with that huge, huge list of things that we can accumulate from all the presentations we've had so far. Um, so this is, this is going to be a, a bit of a hodgepodge of an overview from the point of view of a clinician who is still trying to come to terms with this whole subject. I really have only been engaged properly with regenerative medicine for under two years now, I guess. Uh, and that's probably typical of many of my colleagues who are trying to get into this right now. Um, so, in summary, these things uh, I think are important. I think we are extremely well placed to put the proceeds of regenerative medicine into patients, to get that bench to bedside. Uh, leap made. Um, but clearly, kicking on from that, we, we need to engage with all you guys for the huge part that's going to make it really into patients for long-term patient benefit. Uh, and presently, as you've also heard, we're now engaging with the NIC and TSB and others to develop priority areas for the UK. We're going to need a workforce to deliver this, and whilst I accept that on the ground putting a new bit of tissue that's been generated onto a wound may not be that difficult, I see more to it than that. And I'm, as somebody who's fought very hard for research not to be stripped out of training from not only medicine but also for paramedical uh, training, um, I think we need a workforce which is not only understands this field but is actually capable to bring it forward, capable to talk to you in the sort of language that will enable rapid progress to be made. And I think the UK could do that better than the States. We're going to need the infrastructure as well. We're going to need uh, hospitals which are fit for purpose. And, of course, we're going to need the delivery facilities. Uh, be they large or small. Um, we need to improve <laughs> access to funds, obviously, the way, and I'll come back to that. What I mean is working as part of a team with scientists, with engineers, and with the regulators. And only that way, really, are we going to get access to funds. We spend a lot of time wandering around moaning about how we can't get our, our research funded. 
And actually, we need more realism from the clinician's point of view. And we need to grow and learn. This is all changing so rapidly. And we saw those curves there, and perhaps it will be a roller coaster. Perhaps it will continue to, to gradually find its level. Uh, and if so, we need to develop again as a team and continuously talk to regulators, basic scientists, funders, and to try and understand each other from our own perspectives. As a clinician scientist, particularly as a surgeon scientist, I find myself in a very strange place, in the middle of this bridge with scientists on the one end thinking this guy has never been anywhere near a proper lab, he can't possibly understand the science. And from the other end, we have our NHS managers and our clinician colleagues pulling us back saying, you no need to go there, just get on with what you're supposed to be doing. And so you're stuck in this hard place. And yet trying to entice people from both ends to come and talk to you and people from both ends to be trained in what the other end is doing too. So that again is what I'm going to be talking to the Royal College of Surgeons about later on. We also um, have had a problem in, in when to jump to. And I would like to put it to you that the jumping point we are best placed to make, particularly in surgery. And, and it's, it's something to do with not only the fact that we have a very good understanding of the practical issues of getting substances, materials into the body uh, and the anatomical consequences of that. I think it's also the mindset of surgeons as well. Uh, the surgeons are, are more used to taking clear decisions about things than possibly our physician colleagues. So, for example, uh, when Christian Barnard went to uh, the States to finish his training, he went to a lab where they'd been working on cardiac transplantation for 20 years, making incremental steps forward, getting closer and closer to the clinic, but not quite understanding it 100%. So doing the next experiment, and the next experiment, and the next experiment. But he saw this and said, I'm just going to have a go at this. He took the idea back to South Africa and turned it into heart transplantation. Okay, it wasn't great to start with, but iteratively it improved by studying each patient as it went along. And this is another characteristic of introducing regenerative medicine to the clinic, is that we also have to adopt a new approach to trials too. We have to study each patient as much as we possibly can because they may not go very well to start with. But by studying them and feeding that stuff back into the clinic, we can develop these processes and make them better and learn together. And this is the first case study. This was our experience last year where we had been working on airway replacement for some time using uh, conventional transplantation as our model. Um, but it was gradually coming round to the idea that uh, overcoming immunosuppression and some other issues was going to be a very, very major challenge. So we had started to work on, on tissue engineering and the use of stem cells. Um, when this patient came along who was in her late 20s, with two kids who had reached end stage, she'd had a large part of her uh, lung removed, uh, her windpipe had been shortened, and it was collapsing and causing recurrent pneumonia. So her lifespan was, was foreshortened. Uh, we uh, had a discussion with her about whether she'd be willing to take on something that was very revolutionary, and, and had a discussion amongst ourselves about whether this was the right point in time to jump with this. And between us, we decided to go. Um, and so we uh, decellularised a, a scaffold. We were hearing about decellularised scaffolds earlier on from a, a human donor who was donating liver and kidney and stuff. Uh, and we took some of her own cells, some mesenchymal stem cells, about which we've also heard earlier, differentiated them into chondrocytes. We'd also been developing epithelial cell cultures as a means of relining allografts to stop them rejecting as much. Epithelium expresses a lot of MHC in, 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 in adults. So we were trying to get around that problem. So we already had the technologies available to put together for this. So in my labs in Bristol, we grew up the cells, differentiated them, put them on the bioreactor, um, and, and implanted them successfully into Claudia Castillo. But she, of course, is, is only one, and we do need to do more now. We need to study what's happening to her, and we are continuing to study her. And we know for a fact, this was so thrown together by this European team um, at the last minute, there were, I mean, the process was a mess. You would never have engineered a process like that, particularly the one involving EasyJet. Well, I won't, I won't go into that right now. <laughs> I haven't got time for that one. So, but nonetheless, we can learn from every single step that we made. And serendipity happily was with us on that occasion. More Claudias? Well, we do need funding and we need to work with the regulators. Uh, it's an interesting little, little nuance to regulation that if we get funding to, to do more work in this, we can get ourselves into a position where we are able to move quickly if another Claudia comes along. Uh, but we can't plan to do that. So we can have everything in place, but as soon as we say, we plan to do three in the next two years, it's suddenly a clinical trial. So you can't actually use um, some of the, uh, the easier regulation that comes with emergency use. So that's fine. So we'll just get everything in place and we won't do a clinical trial. But of course, if somebody comes along, we will operate on them. 
Uh, and there's monitoring. There's, uh, there's, so how do we monitor these things? This is very complex. And again, I won't go into this because you've heard about it so much already. Um, and we need good surrogates. Uh, we, we can't rely on some of the very crude methods of measuring decellularization that we used. Uh, and nor can we wait for, for two weeks for the blessed bacteriology results to come back. You know, when, when you know it's, it's just not going to uh, be a functional product at the end of that. So we need excellent surrogates that are correlated with what's actually happening in these products too. And we need reverse translation. So we need to study our patients, iteratively improve, as I was saying, and make sure that the basic scientists are engaged with us as well and are feeding better ideas, better ways of developing stem cells into the process. So I think that at our end, at the scientist clinician end, is where hopefully... We, that's where our strengths are. And then later on, there's all the rest of it. Um, and I'm particularly fascinated. I know nothing about business at all. I've seen nothing. Um, but I am fascinated by the, the prospect of developing innovative business models because travelling around the world and talking in different countries, uh, be they in a socialised system like ours or a kind of mixed economy like the States and parts of Europe, or even places where they have no means of delivering um, effective health care to the vast majority of the population, I believe that regenerative medicine will have a part to play in all of these places in due course. We just need to develop the models that, that will deliver it and enable you guys to actually make a profit out of it too. Okay, case study two. Uh, this struck me on my last trip to America. Um, and in, in a way, there's a social message here about, about what Obama's trying to do to healthcare and all the rest of it. But nonetheless, um, a point was made earlier that you can give people drugs to treat something, but you're not curing that. And this person is going to be a burden on the American healthcare system for the rest of his life, which will be foreshortened because of the disease. And will be an increasing burden as time goes by because he will develop complications of diabetes. So this is a wonderful uh, example of somewhere where a single one-off cure generated by regenerative medicine for diabetes would have an immediate enormous effect, not only on a very common disease, but also on health care uh, delivery. Something like the NHS should be able to absorb something like this, as we were hearing from uh, the last speaker. We're moving into a phase now where we'll be discussing just these issues about the rare diseases like Claudia Castillo against the more common diseases like the diabetic boy. Uh, and this is the team we're putting together. They were... We had developed these by brainstorming, and, but they're, it's a relatively random team of people who are interested and enthusiastic. Um, it's as, as national spread as we could possibly get together, and we're going to be meeting for the first time on Thursday morning. Training, I think, uh, is a big thing, uh, and we heard um, from Richard and Brian about the importance of having a workforce that can deliver these things. Uh, and as I say, I'll be talking to Royal College of Surgeons about this later on today. Uh, but in particular, we need these two things. We need people who are trained to deliver whatever it is, but also people who have a higher level of flexibility, who will be the leaders in the future, the clinical leaders of regenerative medicine, who will say where the priorities ought to be next and how we're going to get there. Importantly, I think, we need to start having surgeons and physicians who are discipline hopping, who are spending time with engineers, who have got combined PhDs, with people in biomechanics, with people in imaging, uh, and, and people who are therefore coming out doubly understanding things and able to act as a bridge, able to stand in the middle and draw the scientists and clinicians from both ends of the bridge together. That's the kind of fellowship I would like to see funded, I think, to support our workforce of the future. And I think this is an area where Britain can very quickly achieve a lead on other parts of the world, provided these people aren't then poached by other countries. Infrastructure, uh, we're, I'm working in an academic health science centre at the moment at UCL. Uh, of course, this is a, um, a drawing together of universities and, and clinicians. And it acts as a, a real hothouse for developing ideas and getting through to the first in man studies that we've been talking about. But more and more academic health science centres are being seen as the hub from which we can disseminate treatment out to a wider population. And Quite rightly, the government is dragging us there, and I think they're absolutely right to do so. We cannot stay just at the high end of technology. We've got to work out how some of this can be disseminated out, not just for the people of central London and our tertiary referral population, but how it can affect the, people, the wider mass of people from all socioeconomic groups across North London and out into Essex, the so-called HIEX, the higher innovation economic clusters that are now being formed. And we need to think about how it's going to be delivered out there too. Uh, funding is obviously an issue, and there's a, a feeling that uh, 
the, the, the mass of people who have ideas aren't getting access to funds for one reason or another, and that it's co confined to smaller groups of individuals. But again, partnerships the way forward. There's no doubt high-level partnerships between uh, multidisciplinary teams to get across these barriers. This is the uh, NIHR, it's the National Institute for Health Research, and these are the various funding streams which are made available. It's labyrinthine, and it's, it's, uh, there are, aren't many clinical academics even who have really got their head around these funding streams. There's very particular ways to apply for this. You have to have patients writing part of the proposal, which is quite, quite difficult to do sometimes. Um, and it has to absolutely hit the mark with the reviewers uh, who, uh, as well, uh, as usual. Uh, some of these pots are grossly underspent, or at least were, like the health technology assessment, uh, so there are opportunities here, um, but it's a question of when the NIHR is prepared to pick up and run with these things. Here's the NIHR. Oh, actually it's not. This actually is the National uh, Institute for Cancer Research, but I've superimposed the NIHR over the top. The National Institute for Cancer Research works very well, um, but there are certain problems when it's been extrapolated to more common diseases uh, and other diseases by, through the NIHR. Uh, one is that there's no delivery mechanism for the clinical trials particularly, um, and there's a dearth of local overall specialty leaders, but particularly there's no input, there's no prioritisation. And that is why the formation of this group, this first step that we've heard about and that we're going to start on on Thursday, is so important, because there is no uh, established mechanism, mechanism for doing that. We can now do that for regenerative medicine. That input to the NIHR can be created. And there's this too. Uh, this is uh, funding and the funding gap as we perceive it, as I'm uh, sure as you perceive it too. In the, the conventional funding bodies of that 54 million, whatever it was, mm -hmm. uh, something like, if you look at the, the, the pie charts of that, something like 85%, it goes into basic science and supporting basic science institutes. And of course, we need that. We are very strong in it, of course we need that. But that leaves very little, really, for the clinical trials and the translation, uh, which is all in this big box here. And the phase three clinical trials are where the NIHR might pick it up at the bottom, and help us lead it into the National Health Service, again, in partnership with appropriate industrial partners. But the bit in between is very diffuse. I know the MRC are, are fighting to see how they can cover this area, um, and some other funding bodies too. But it's not clear, and, and, and this is a real, real problem for us all. Uh, I notice I've got the bit on automation up here too. Because you know, I I, 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 I'm clearly that's going to be hugely important. Regulation, we've heard a lot about already. I won't bang on about that too much. Um, obviously, there's a big difference between cell therapies and drugs. Suffice to say, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that they're now thinking about having a special group for regenerative medicine. That's absolutely right. Um, and I've actually found them extremely responsive if you, to, to talking to. Uh, if you go along and say, here's a case study, this is the problems we've had getting this in to the clinic, they'll say, OK, well, this is how we need to feed this back into the system. It's not great. Actually, talking to my colleague, clinical colleagues in the States who are trying to do the same things that I am, they don't necessarily find it any easier in America. I think perhaps in drawing up our very complex uh, roadmap, um, all we've done is we've put all our cards on the table, and that I don't think the FDA necessarily have. I think there's a lot of hidden stuff in the middle of the FDA which makes it difficult for them to deliver too. Uh, nonetheless, it's not good advertising <laughs> for this country. Okay, so in summary, um, I think... British clinical scientists are well placed to help and work with you guys to get this forward. Um, we are obviously, uh, we, we do need your help to get this into the mass of patients. We can't do that. We get into the first in man studies. We're engaging to develop priorities which we hope will streamline where the UK is going in this field and make us uh, future proofed to an extent with our more limited resources, make sure we direct them the right way. Uh, I think we're going to need a workforce and that's down to uh, us uh, as clinicians and the colleges uh, but I think we need to do that in partnership too and have people who have dual experience of, of both surgery and engineering if we're going to take this forward like Chris Mason for example. Uh, we need infrastructure um, to deliver this um, better access to funds to fill that big funding gap in the middle uh, and we all need to grow and learn together and just keep talking and, and fora like this are absolutely essential. So this bridge, I, thought, I hope, is going to be jolly loaded with people. In fact, it's, it's, it's not a great analogy now, because the bridge, you've got people coming in from all angles now, haven't you? So it's kind of a web of things. But I'll, I'll think of another analogy. <laughs> so uh, lots of people have helped me. Paolo Maccherini, who uh, was the, the real driving force behind our, our graft, Chris Mason, Mark Lyle, Axel Feli, Ian Reese at the MHRA, John Egan, who's setting up this process. Um, and, oh, yes, sorry, 
And uh, just to point out where I'm... Oh, I've gone. Hello. Just to say, at the moment, all, all of my funding in this area is from the, from the United States. So I'd very, very much like some British funding, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, Tony's given me the brief introduction. I, I'm chair of many things, including the Remedy Project with David Williams. Um, somebody said I have more chairs than IKEA at the moment. Um, <laughs> Uh, I should explain, uh, despite the fact this is mostly about industrial issues, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, I'm an automation engineer by training, and I put the first cell therapy onto a robot 21 years ago, which was erythropoietin, which uh, somebody alluded to, which I think is about 12 billion sales at the moment. Um, and everybody thinks biotech's very difficult. Um, we actually designed the machine that makes it one Thursday afternoon. Uh, just by contrast, I was also involved in the scale-up of Cadbury's Flake, which took 30 man years and three years to do, to make a thousand Cadbury's Flakes per minute. And after that period of time, it still didn't work. So don't always get the idea that biotech is very difficult relative to other things. Um, it's an easy trap to fall into. Right, moving on. Um, there we go. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'm effectively chairman of the Trade Association for the Regen Med companies in the UK, which incorporates stem cells and, and scaffolds and many other things. Um, this is something I've stolen from um, Greg Bonfiglio and uh, as modified by Paul Kemp of Intercytex. Some of you have seen it before. The Gartner curve is something that looks at uh, what happens to new technologies when they appear. I think originally produced for the electronics industry and um, the point being that whenever some new technology appears, in this particular case they're looking at tissue engineering, there's a huge surge in interest, um, followed by a huge decline as the hype um, is, is not fulfilled. As somebody said, the only people who make any money in that stage are the consultants and conference organisers. Uh, and so generally speaking, it's referred to as the hype cycle. You then enter the trough of disillusionment, um, where it all goes pear-shaped and the VCs all buy, bail out again because they've lost all their money. And then over a period of time, there's the so-called slope of enlightenment where people um, start to be able to buy standard techniques, they start to sort of get better expertise and skills into the company. And eventually, um, there's the so-called plateau of productivity where you finally d deliver the promise that you, you made uh, 10 or 15 years earlier. Um, there's a question about whether we're really in this phase or we're just going into another hype cycle at the moment, but we'll probably not go into that in too much detail. So the role of industry in this process is um, really the blue piece of this diagram. Um, there's a huge amount of effort, uh, both in the UK and globally, going into the basic research, primarily in the biology and life sciences, um, particularly with stem cells. Um, and uh, there's perhaps a failure to understand, as well as uh, should be the case, all the other things that have to be done to take a product to market such that both it's been approved by the regulators and adopted by the clinicians. Um, and um, to some extent, as Chris alluded to, there's something of an imbalance at the moment between the effort that's going into the green triangle and the effort that's going into the blue. So I'm not going to labour these points, but basically what, what else has to be done once the research has been finished? Um, somebody has to establish that there really is a market for this product um, and define it explicitly with the clinicians, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, one of the many issues with regenerative medicine products is you need a much better interface with a clinician than you would if you were making a round white tablet that gets sold to you through boots. Um, it's pretty easy to self-administer that. Um, several rounds of finance and or grants. Uh, and, um, I have to say, in the current climate, it's mostly grants and not too much finance. Working out what price the market will pay, health economics and reimbursement, as David alluded to, is a critical thing. Generally speaking, the health economics argument is carried out right at the end of the, the, the regulatory and approval process in the UK. So you get through all this pain and suffering, and then um, NICE will tell you that they, uh, the UK can't afford it. It would be quite useful to know that right at the start. Um, so making the business case and knowing what the market will pay um, for an advanced therapy is, is one of the key skills in the space. 
underlying the, the, the understanding the underlying science. Um, many of these things work, but nobody really knows why. Uh, nobody knows if they've been optimised. I suspect, as, as David alluded to, you won't have seen Toyota type optimization methods generally being applied to these products before they um, get out into the marketplace. You need some pretty exotic facilities and equipment. You've got to recruit and train staff. Um, you have to develop a stable process, which David alluded to, um, and most particularly methods to measure it. Um, and for the engineers, basically, we're dealing with a world where rulers and micrometers don't exist. There is no way of measuring things. Um, you do it by making it the same way you used to make it um, and hope it's still the same. Um, various regulatory bodies, which we'll come back to. Um, you then got to get your first clinical trial underway, and this is just the first one. It might be just the proof of concept, 30 patients, one to two million pounds. It gets progressively bigger and more expensive as you move through the trials process. And sadly, you may get to the end of that, and let's go back to Old Kent Road. Um, uh, very few companies at the moment come for you to go around this route once, never mind about several times. <coughs> So what's it like being a, a regenerative medicine company in the UK? Um, with the exception of the pharmaceutical companies who are starting to get into this space, most particularly Pfizer, um, it's mostly dominated by SMEs. There's, there's essentially no mid-sized companies in the space at the moment. Um, most of them have probably got less than one year's cash left, and they've got all the hard things to, to do um, that we alluded to before. Um, Generally speaking, they're pathfinding, um, so uh, there are all these issues they have to become competent and expert in, even though nobody's been there before. Just an example, if you take the QC point in the middle, um, you're talking about manufacturing products that may have a shelf life of four days. It's probably worse than a Sainsbury's lettuce in that sense. Um, on the other hand, the standard test for sterility of these things takes two weeks to carry out. So um, what do you do? Do you put the thing into the patient and hope it was sterile and find out it wasn't later? Or do you have to find a new way of testing it? And so the whole kind of characterisation and measurement um, field is poorly supported from the physics and engineering perspective at the moment. Um, so you have to deal with all this technology complexity, all the biological complexity and the issues of the Pope. It's pretty complicated. Um, there's not a lot of people out there who've done this before. Um, so you're generally speaking starting with a keen and enthusiastic team, but you've got to do it all yourself and start with a clean sheet of paper. Um, and the reality is these companies have between 5 and 40 employees, um, but nonetheless there's a general desire on the part of an ageing nation that we're going to fix all their problems. Um, and uh, the reality and the expectation are a bit out of line at this point in time. Um, I'll just digress at this point into definitions of regenerative medicine. You've heard the Mason description, which is widely used. You've heard the, the Williams description and several others. Um, as a pragmatist, my view is that the best description of uh, regenerative medicine is your bits will be ready on Tuesday. <laughs> so basically these companies have relatively small amounts of funds. They have lots to do. And what tends to be happening at the moment is that um, they can't raise any more finance until they've got a positive outcome from a first clinical trial. That's going to cost them, as you saw, between one and two million. And essentially what's happening in the business sense is that they're putting all their, all their chips on red and hoping the, the, the red comes in. And sadly, it's equally likely to come in black. And um, that's the end of the company, which is quite sad in many respects because many of these companies have a plethora of interesting therapies coming through it's just they probably pick the wrong one to put through first. Um, but all that expertise gets wiped out and the facilities get wiped out and we have to start all over again. So we've touched on this to some extent already. Um, compared to small molecules and conventional biologics, these are much harder to make. Um, so the cost of goods for some of these therapies, particularly the more complex ones, could be 10 to 20% of the achievable sales price that society will pay. Um, and if anybody thinks that pharmaceuticals are expensive to manufacture, they're not. The cost of goods is about 0.4% of the sales price. So if the cost of making a pharmaceutical doubles because you're not doing it very efficiently, who gives a damn? If the cost of making one of these products doubles, basically you don't have a business. 
Mm -hmm. The other point of there, of course, is that you can't kind of launch the product with a slightly ineffective manufacturing system and then make it better later. You've actually got to get the most effective manufacturing system sorted out from the outset. A lot of this stuff, again, you can't make it by hand, even at small scale. It just doesn't come out right. And you can't go and buy a standard suite of equipment and tools that will sort of knock this stuff out for you um, uh, and reliably and, and know that it's going to work. You've got to do it all yourself. And because it tends to have to happen in a fairly expensive clean room, the, the whole facility tends to be expensive and there's not a great deal of choice of experienced subcontractors who can help you out either. So it's um, a pretty steep hill to climb. This is a figure I think I got from you, Colin. I don't know, this is the BBSRC funding for stem cells. It's a research in the... Estimate for the national for public sector. Public sector funding of academic stem cell research, 56 million. Um, this is what we think the amount of money that was raised in the investment markets in the UK last year for, for going into stem cell companies and regenerative medicine businesses. Virtually nothing. Um, but there's a pretty well understood algorithm that um, once you've done the R&D, you have to spend 100 times more to take it to market. So um, Chris's seesaw diagram is pretty indicative. It's more like a whale and a flea at this point in time on this, <laughs> I would say. There's one issue that, that has become increasingly apparent to us when we start to explore this, this space, is that there's an assumption that all the new stuff comes from academia. Um, and in fact, there's quite a lot of innovation going on, which has originated pretty much from day one within the companies. So there are some reasonably well-established methods by which academics can take their uh, products and their research through into some sort of um, translational activity, take it into patients. Um, but there's no equivalent system by which an SME can do that, other than paying for it themselves all the way through. Um, and that's proving to be a bit, a bit of a hurdle that we're trying to deal with with um, some government funding at the moment. Um, but you do talk to some of the research councils and they just have a view that this all comes from academia, and in fact it doesn't. So very little investment, um, lack of evidence. Um, this, is, this is equally applicable pre-credit crunch. It's even worse now. So very little money in the markets. Um, and the, the, the general sense is that um, we've been given a headlong advantage because of George W. Bush holding things up, um, which has been great. That's all changing now. But if we don't establish and sort of lock this industry down in the UK within the next two or three years, um, it's going to get gobbled up by the monster across the Atlantic. So the kind of big ambition is that uh, we've seen, I think, most of the, the, the biotech IP in the UK exploited elsewhere. Some people made a small amount of money out of it, but the real money was made by taking the value stack off to the states. So we need to grow an industrial base uh, and all the engineering aspects that go around that um, and make it stay here. So we want to capture the value stack over 20 years, not the, the IP for the next two. Um, there's a lot of talk about translation bench to bedside. Uh, that's, the, in many respects, the easy bit. It's the one-to-many translation such that thousands of people can receive this therapy of high quality and to a cost that the society can avoid, uh, afford. <coughs> so this requires a pretty substantial investment in infrastructure, skills, uh, alongside the R&D, um, to make sure that in the very near future you can't scale up and do this sort of production anywhere else better in the world. Otherwise, it's going to go, and we might as well have not started. I'll not attempt to take you through um, acronyms or us, um, but there are a huge number of regulatory bodies in the UK that have some role in regenerative medicine that, shall we say, don't have a role in some of the other therapies. Um, and um, this is probably an incomplete list of people who have to be sort of influenced when you're doing some of this stuff. Um, one of the reasons that stem cell activity got started pretty early in the UK was because we had a pretty comprehensive set of regulatory bodies to keep an eye on things and make them happen. Um, the downside is we're now a bit overprovided with regulation and, and this needs trimming down and um, turning into a slicker thing because aside from the, being a millstone for the UK companies, it's um, 
the opportunities for inward investment that would otherwise be there for US corporations to come here and kind of take a look at this list of um, bodies and uh, get a little concerned. Um, so there is a view that said, actually, if you want to give somebody some advice who's doing the stuff in the UK, they should go to the States as soon as possible. Um, there's been a roadmap, a regulatory roadmap, published by the Department of Health about six months ago, which is a reasonably effective piece of work, which says how you take a stem cell um, therapy through to market and who you'd have to talk to all along the way. Um, most people thought this was pretty impressive. In practice, all it demonstrates is the complexity of the problem um, uh, and the number of regulatory bodies you have to deal with um, to, to get the thing approved. Um, but there are some discussions that I'm involved with with the main the medical and health regula regulator authority, which is the main medicines um, body, are looking at some sort of body that means small companies can go there and get a comprehensive set of advice from one point. So the good news, um, just to wonder why we get out of bed any morning, in the morning, um, the Office of Life Sciences, which is something Lord Drayson set up this year, has published a blueprint for life sciences with a very specific em emphasis within that on regenerative medicine as a particular topic. It's one of three new strategic priorities for the Technology Strategy Board for industrial investment alongside um, low carbon and digital economy. Um, uh, in total, there's at least 21.5 million of money available to go into these companies to fund technical work, clinical work, um, and tools and technologies. Um, one of the big challenges of the OLS blueprint is uh, it wants to see government become an innovation champion. Um, that means the NHS becoming open to testing out new things for SMEs. Um, you can probably imagine that's a pretty difficult cultural challenge for some of these large government bodies who are not necessarily associated with innovation. Um, and the regulators want to help. It's not their fault that it's complicated. Um, they do want to make things happen. So that's kind of the, the state of the universe and some of the engineering issues from the industry perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, and thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And indeed, I hope you'll agree, we've had an absolutely excellent um, range of speakers presenting to you today. And this is going to be an open discussion, and I'd like us to think about... 50, um, We've got to finish exactly at quarter past five because the room closes. But we have uh, Royal Ac Academy of Engineering wine is the best wine in London. Um, so it's worth hanging around and with that to look forward to. So I'm going to open this up. Um, but I wanted to just reflect on the initial questions that we, we set ourselves. And I'd like this meeting to have an output. We, we, we've got some um, video material to replay and you can review on the internet. But if we can get out of this meeting some outputs of policy, what engineering should become and what engineering should do to embrace um, regenerative medicine, then I think that would be an excellent um, achievement. Okay. So from that point, I'd like to just um, open to the audience to take up any questions. And all questions should come through the microphone in order to be um, recorded with name and, and question, if you don't mind. Are there, is anybody going to be the first volunteer? Thank you. Uh, Brian Davis, Professor Brian Davis, uh, Technical Director of Acrobot Company. Um, primarily for Chris Mason, you, you showed some um, work with eyes and the difficulty of gathering tissue and then the very s small number of difficult cells, very expensive to produce. So in the short term, as engineers, we can give you devices which will place those very precisely in a specific location. But is that really just a short-term fix? Are you going to be able to solve this problem very quickly and there won't be a, a, an issue about small numbers of cells because they'll be very plentiful, very cheap, and you can just pour them in? You've raised a, a very good question. And I think that the best way to answer is to say that, first of all, there really are two components to this industry. There is the one that's product driven, so called allogeneic, that's universal, where we can look at true scale up. And then we have the other side of the coin, which is autologous, where we're looking at personalized therapies, which was the latter one. Now, 
that is very much a service industry. So we've got two elements here. One is where we'll have leading a large number of people for that service industry, a lot of training involved. And the other industry, the actual products um, coming from commercial companies, which will need more of the scale-up, more of the automation that Richard spoke about. And it's really a pooling of the two together. But what I do genuinely believe is what that we learn with those small projects is that we develop generic skills and equipment to do the whole process. Brian, just to add to that, it's pretty clear from some, some of the North American experience that people are thinking very, very hard about the number of cells you need for a dose because it's part of the thing that determines what the cost of goods are. So it's a, a cost-effectiveness part of, the, uh, part of that, that discussion. Are there any questions from the floor? Okay, well, yes. Malcolm. <laughs> Thank you. Comment as much as a question. Really. This morning, uh, Richard organised a meeting of the Re regenerative industry group. Uh, about 20 companies in the UK that are involved in this. Now, I, I would suggest those are the people who should be answering this question, really, because I think those will be the people who take regenerative medicines out of the the lab and into into the clinic in a in a mass way. We, you can't have this discussion without involving the commercial world. Yeah. Uh, well, hold on. I think there's two bits. I think the service side will always be embedded in the NHS. So I think there's two valid industries here. One is certainly the, the companies that will produce universal products at quantity. Totally agreed. But I think there's also an equally large opportunity, such as um, we've seen with IVF, where we have an industry that's embedded within the NHS service. That has a benefit to patients, no doubt, but it also has an opportunity for wealth. And medical tourism, whilst it's perceived as a grubby world, needn't be. And you know, in, in my time when I was training, you know, the London teaching hostels were full of people coming to London for their therapy, which helped subsidise the NHS. And so I think we have to build both an industry in the UK of companies, plus an industry that's embedded in the NHS service. Just behind you. Uh, Julian Gardner, University of Warwick. Uh, in, my, in my lab, we've been growing some cells, some hum, human embryonic kidney cells. And so I've got a simple question, which is, how many cells do we need to grow per year to keep this industry going? Because that, I think, is uh, fundamental. For me, growing these little blasted things has been a pain in the neck. They keep dying, and I'm just working on a small scale. So how many billions of things do we need to grow? And then we could work at... The business case. Um, um, a rough rule of thumb for many of these therapies is about 15 million cells, which is hardly any, actually. Um, I did an exercise for one of the RM companies in the UK who's involved in a, a therapy that uses about that many cells, um, who were kind of rather imagining setting up an enormous clean room and facilities, you know, somewhere that was going to cost tens of millions, and actually. Uh, a small lab with a robot and a person could make enough 15,000 patients a year. Um, now, if you want to make an entire liver, that's a bit different. I'm sure Chris will probably know how many cells there are in a liver, probably about 10 to the 11 or something like that, which is a little more complicated. It's, it's a very good question. I think what one has to do is say the industry really has two components. It has direct cell replacement where you do need to put in the right numbers of cells, and which is right. If you want to deliver you know, 10 to the 11 cells, 10 to the 12 cells, something like that is, is the right sort of order for a complete organ. That's direct cell replacement. But many of the therapies we're looking at, like, um, for example, if someone has a heart attack, putting some stem cells in to modify the disease progression so they don't go into heart failure, we do not need the same numbers of cells. And maybe may be much more sort of dose responsive, more like a sort of pharmaceutical, where maybe by we get away with, say, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 cells. So for those ones where we disrupt a natural d d disease progression or where we need some sort of immunomodulation, low numbers, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, if we're replacing a whole organ or its function, Probably more like Richard said, somewhere between 10 to the 8 to maybe 10 to the 11. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Have a follow-up. Just a quick, quick follow-up. Does that mean one small company could supply the world's needs in sales? Absolutely. I think if you looked at things like uh, retinal, pig, um, sorry, um, age-related macular degeneration, it's a project UCL, it's about 40,000 cells per eye, yes, easily. Okay. There was a question right at the back corner. Could you give your name, please? Michael Leake, the Weinberg Group. Um, 
back in 1994, I was working with, um, as was Mike Raxworthy, who's up there, with Advanced Tissue Sciences and um, Smith and Nephew, putting fibroblasts onto scaffolds and sticking those into, into chronic wounds. Wind back to now, wind forward to now, and in some ways, things haven't changed. How do the panel think we can implement step changes so that we can actually move forward and realize John Fisher's dream? Anybody would like to take that one on? Can I just add to the history? Because I was involved with the company <laughs> before Mike was. Um, <laughs> um, the, the company was called ATS, Advanced Tissue Sciences, in, in, um, in San Diego. And uh, they were making a treatment for venous leg ulcers in particular with, with, with living skin. Um, and um, we put some machines in there and tracked their history. And it wasn't entirely an ideal environment to be using robots because they had no engineers whatsoever. Um, and they took on an engineer who was extremely competent and started to speed things up, get the process right, do some numbers and measure things and all those kind of weird things that engineers do. Um, and their fortune started to improve and um, she asked for a pay rise and they wouldn't give her one so she went to work for Qualcomm in San Diego instead. Um, and she was the only engineer in the place and the company just went downhill and I think the total investment loss in the business was about $120 million in total because they had no engineering capacity in the sense of how to look at things in the right way. It wasn't, you know, a sizing a flange. It was kind of just working some numbers out and setting up a process flow that made sense. And jokes about making Cadbury's flake as opposed to skin. You know, it, it's, it is not that difficult if you know what you're doing and look at it from an engineering process point of view. But um, I think the, the biologist is probably the last single disciplinary science that's left in the sense you can do quite a lot without meeting anybody outside your discipline. Um, you know... I think we need to get to the stage where we're looking at something that looks a bit more like a Large Hadron Collider. It's all engineering and a little bit of physics. Professor Fisher. I suppose um, I would reflect on my experience going back 30, 35 years in, in terms of as an early medical engineer and being involved in the artificial heart program. And I think the artificial heart program only really uh, started to generate uh, good solutions when, when actually the program identified uh, tractable problems that it could solve. And I think one of the things we have to do in regenerative medicine is start to choose the problems that we can solve to get the clinical experience. And they may not be the really big, the really big challenges that we can all identify. I think Martin indicated that in, in his presentation. I think then, both as engineers and biological scientists, we can come together and demonstrate clinical uh, efficacy, patient benefit. And actually, I think once we start doing that, I actually think that the funding paradigm turns on its head, in fact, and people will start to put a lot more support into the translation then because we can really show that we can deliver what's needed from a patient benefit, but also from the economic benefit that companies can make money out of it because in reality this will really only move certainly in the Chris's first model is when businesses start making money out of it. Okay David Williams. Uh, as some of you might know we're at Loughborough we're very busily doing the thought experiment of what this GMP facility this automated little factory might look like. The automation is relatively straightforward running the automation at high OEE, a nasty little manufacturing systems word that we come from, from our conventional engineering world, is very important and very hard to do. And also understanding what regulatory systems we need in place to make that little factory work is also uh, very important to do. It's, it's, in terms of GMP, it's the noise around the engineering that is the thing we need to get our arms around. We particularly need support from our regulatory colleagues, super to see the comment that Martin had had lots of help from Ian Rees in, in working on his, uh, his uh, transplant. Uh, I think we need to engage harder and harder and harder to get rid of some of those uh, ambiguities that will allow us to put the business plans together. Even if those business plans are around a, a grant culture and they're not quite yet commercial, um, there is an incremental step. And, there's a few things to do to make that incremental step. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to thank the last question because it led us to answer the first question on the list. Is there a role for engineering? And I think the reflections of Richard Archer from the past suggest that there is indeed a role for engineering and engineers within the discipline. So 
uh, we can move on from there. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to move on and get to a point that how does that role become embedded within engineering itself? Because the presentations you've heard today come from, if you don't mind me saying, absolutely the, the top engineers working in the field in this country. They are the, the creme de la creme, in, um, as we say in uh, thing. And um, what we need to do is more embed this practice within the engineering community. And I reflect upon my own, um, I, I suppose, my own career, because as a graduate of the 70s, I came through the medical, um, bi medical engineering departments, which were set up in the 60s by a few academics who decided that engineers really need to talk to clinicians. And they got together initially, of course they did, they've done it throughout the ages, but within the 60s and 70s, they started to do it as an organisation. And um, organisations such as the Royal Academy of Engineering then started the UK focus and started to support the interaction of clinicians and engineers, and you had the discipline of medical engineering coming along. Now, my question comes, is, is a similar step needed for regenerative medicine? Is, is, is there something institutionally missing from um, the, the landscape in order to make engineering adopt regenerative medicine? Uh, and I'd like all the panel to perhaps consider that point. I think something that would really help is that um, the life scientists and the clinician, of which I also wear those hats, are not really aware of what engineering is. They think of mechanical engineering maybe, but then they forget that there's biochemical engineering, chemical engineering, and all the other aspects that make it up. And what would be very helpful to the sector would be, say, a little booklet, which has some sort of contact points for the various different specialities between it and what they have to offer the sector. And I think that would be something that would be used if it was distributed, could be on the website, but I think actually something printed that went out to the UK community, which is with all the stakeholders, about four or 5,000 people would be very valid. Mr. Bryant. Um, my recent experience in working with Department of Health on priorities has highlighted to me, or has brought to the attention of DH, the, the word design. You can't move anywhere in DH, um, the latest, design bugs out, design away infection, design, and the designers, and I mean that in the arty sense of the world, have very much had free reign in the healthcare sector lately, and it annoys me no end. <laughs> the, the, it's half, there's a concept, and that concept needs to come to reality through engineering. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I think we're, we're a quiet voice, and we need to speak up for ourselves. And some, something like Chris has just said would go a long way. I think, I think I absolutely agree with that, and I, I think the Hayek that I alluded to up at the end was it's an example of that, actually. It's, it's a high, high ideal concept with, with no idea how they can deliver it whatsoever. I mean, really, no idea. So, I mean, I think from the clinician's point of view, we're still trying to get our heads around, I think, and, you know, I, I can't speak for all, all medicine, but I'll try and do so, around the whole field of regenerative medicine and what it's going to mean for us for the future. And that's why I do believe we need to get some of our brightest minds involved in this right now and co-trained. And the more I think about it, the, the, more, the better idea I think it is that we have joint PhDs at this field. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's through that sort of link that uh, we will start to realise what engineers have to offer. I presented the Woolmer Lecture to the Institute uh, for um, Engineers in Medicine uh, a few weeks ago, and, and the breadth of what goes on in, in engineering medicine is just immense. And, and despite having been in, you know, since 19, I won't go, but a long time anyway. I've been in hospitals for a long time. I, it hadn't, the penny hadn't dropped the sheer contribution of, of engineers to everything that I do as a surgeon. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you may also want to think similarly about how you develop an, uh, a fit-for-purpose workforce in engineering too, with, with the NHS. Mm. Could I ask the, the sponsor organisations? We've got some UK stem cell network. <laughs> Here. Uh, the UK Stem Cell Network's been working with engineers over the past year to try and set down some of what engineering has to offer the field and, and what stem cell biologists and, and clinicians uh, require. So we do have some of that information available. We're just trying to work out really how, how best to get the two fields together. Um, 
you do hear stem cell biologists and clinicians talking about the concept of happy cells, which is a completely ill-defined and abstract concept to an engineer, and, and that, in, a, in essence, de defines part of the cultural problem in, in understanding. And, and we found that it's not so much the links with um, biochemical engineers and tissue engineers that are the problem. There's a natural interface with biologists and, and clinicians there already. It's involving the mainstream chemists and physical scientists and mathematical modelers um, that is probably the greater challenge. Any other comments? Zahid? Um, from, from Technology Strategy Board's perspective, we... we um, treat the medicines and healthcare space very much as a, a, a challenge space. So um, sort of working with, 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 uh, with, with Martin, we'd be looking to, to see whether we can articulate challenges in the area and essentially be technology agnostic as to what the solution is going to look like. Because ultimately we, we can't predetermine what a solution could be and there may be more than one solution to a particular problem. What we'd like to do is make sure that we, we engage um, the different technology providers in, in different communities. So, we, for example, we, we, as well as the health technologies and medicines, KTM, we, we fund a number of others. And it's about bringing all those, all those technology providers to, to bear, um, to, to address a lot of the challenges that are being faced. And a lot of the time it's about um, people's engagement and enthusiasm in, in, in addressing that particular challenge as much as the market opportunity for them. But I think if, if you, we can articulate both, and sort of say, this is the challenge. These are, this is the, the, you know, the, the, the big carrot at the end, that you, you, or the big prize at the end that might be there for you. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's all down to risk and, and being able to engage these people, not, not just their enthusiasm, but their technology and their innovative ways of thinking. Colin? Yeah, just as a, a sponsor of really um, basic scientific research in this area. You know, I look at the number of things that come across my desk which are in terms of research grants, and I can see that we have a number of different strands of funding, uh, and that there are obviously some very skilled people who are working in the bioprocess sector who are scaling up the production of cells. There are people who are working on the construction of, uh, of uh, matrix and engineering scaffolds, um, people who are working on cartilage, cornea, bone, and bladder, the tissue engineering, and people who are trying to scale up and scale down these things. And these are cross-disciplinary groupings, but maybe some of those people don't necessarily interact in quite the same way as, as they should. And I mean, if you feel there are gaps here, then it'd be useful to know um, if we need to hold any kind of workshop or meeting to get these people together to talk in a more interactive way. I'd be grateful of any advice you could offer, because it's the sort of thing that we as a group of people can organise. John, can I offer something? Yes, yes. Yeah. A merciless plug for, for, for John and I. Um, John and I are experts at levering cash out of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, who are very accommodating, aren't they, John? <laughs> we both have doctoral training centres in regenerative medicine, which are intended to create a workforce of people with a physical sciences background who have the courage to engage with the biology. Um, so we both have DTCs there now in their second year, so there's a cadre of 20 or 30 bright young things who are all looking for real problems to work on, which is something we need to recognise. And I think Zahid's comment about the challenge space is interesting because one of the things that I've learnt about this multidisciplinary area is that actually engineers, pharmacists and surgeons are very, very similar people. They're all problem-driven. Um, and that, that, once you get under the skin and away from the vocabulary, they're all the same. Um, and that's a great opportunity for us. But is it not the case that there is a translational role in terms of the language used by those groups? So the biologists need to communicate with the engineers. We, we talked about happy cells and what that means and how that just does not translate at all into anything which is conceptually engineering. And, and being able to build that link. Isn't, isn't there something missing there? You and I are old men, John. Um, <laughs> we, we, we speak the language we were trained in. Uh, our younger colleagues, I think, uh, are much more willing to embrace the different languages than perhaps we are, or certainly I was. Um, so I think we have to recognise that this is a changing field. 
um, it'll migrate. One of the one of the things that I think we've said is the rate of change in this field is phenomenal. Um, and the young people with these multiple sets of, of, of vocabularies now, their challenge will be keeping up. Um, I don't think it will be language. Yeah. <coughs> Perhaps it's because of that rate of change and the need to accelerate it is related to our age, David. And <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions from all of that? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, Samson Rogers, the Technology Partnership. Um, I think we've heard a lot today about the, um, the role of engineering um, in, in sort of certain aspects of re regenerative medicine, um, particularly in bio biomaterials development, um, in automation and scale up and manufacturing, and other, other areas such as uh, measurement and characterization. Um, perhaps, well, you know, as, as you in the, the discussion just now, one of the difficulties is that um, there's not a lot of commercial um, activity, in, I mean, engineering activity in, in any of these sort of fields at the moment applied to, uh, I mean, um, apply, applied to medicine. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of difficult because there's, there's aren't, there aren't many people trained in it and, um, I mean, for many engineers trained in it or, or experienced in um, in, in developing these kinds of things. Um, but there, there is, of course, another, an, another um, engineering discipline which is sort of very commercial and, um, and very applied to medicine, and that's the uh, development of surgical tools. Um, of course, um, developing bi biolog biological implants, um, uh, to typically each, um, each implant, um, the company might have to develop a, a surgical tool to go with it, because, of course, minimizing... Um, Surgery time is a sort of key factor in selling uh, these products. Um, I wonder if um, uh, we could have some, uh, if there are any sort of comments on on, on, on the importance or, or role of uh, sort of surgical tools. In I mean, uh, of course, it's it's um, another thing is that it's something that engineers can picture their I think picture their involvement in more easily because uh, so developing a surgical tool is more sort of um, closer to sort of traditional engineering um, uh, um, training than, than um, say, working with uh, soft material, soft biological materials on, on long time scales as they grow and develop. Surgical tools? <laughs> I, think, I think it's a really good question. Um, the example that Richard gave of advanced tissue sciences is superb. This was a company that thought they could do everything, right down to making their own media and generating their own electricity. Now, they failed, and that, I think, was a, a large component of it. Now what we believe is there is the, the value chain, which goes all the way through from obtaining the cells all the way to bioprocessing and popping it back in the patient, which includes distribution uh, and, and, and storage. And there is clearly... Um, opportunities for people to work in all those different unit operations. So for, for, for tools, for example, you know, if we had a really nice biopsy device for the eye, great to take those, um, those stem cells. Likewise, it would be superb to have a way of re-implanting them. And a lot of these would be generics, and there's no reason why the UK could not be a major centre for producing some of this equipment for both harvesting cells in an efficient, reliable manner, and also re-implanting them, and to some extent, storage, distribution, and all the other activities that are involved. It isn't only about the bioprocessor. My, my, my initial response is that... Um, we would quite like products which we can use our existing surgical implements on, I think, because we're used to using them. And, and, and for the majority, I was just trying to wrap my brains about the various applications that have been discussed today and in the past, and um, the various tools. I think that that's a good one, harvesting the, the cells from the eye. But for the majority of applications, you, you really want something that will embed very quickly in, in the National Health Service, particularly using existing technology. But that's not to say that these existing technologies should not move on. They certainly should. And we should think about uh, making things that are are used now for routine purposes, make them more disposable because you wouldn't be able to use them again, for example. Uh, we also need to extend, I think, beyond putting it in. Um, most of this patient's life with their new organ or their new cells is going to be beyond that initial treatment point. Uh, and so we need very good ways, preferably cheap, effective, maybe single devices, which uh, are easy to use for monitoring the progress of whatever we put in. And I think... For me, that would be a bigger need, I think, than actually physically putting in. There was a, a question. 
Yeah, we've got one question there, and then we'll, 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 we'll come around. Hi, it's Stephen Hillier from Chemistry Innovation. Um, I apologise for this, but my question is going to be on regulation. Um, a lot of people that I speak to, uh, biomaterials or um, s small molecule guys, who are very interested in regenerative medicine, have got a lot of good ideas, but the excuse they then give quite often is, we can't get the funding um, because of the regulation, because it's too difficult and we can't take the ideas forward. And a lot of the speakers today have mentioned all the different regulatory bodies, lots of the different issues. So I guess my broad question to the panel is, um, what's the best way of streamlining this regulation? Um, are the steps that the MR8, MHRA taking the best? Or is it something that needs to be additionally funded by a body, I don't know, such as the TSB or others, to really sort of punch through this um, to give smaller companies effectively the, um, the blueprint for how to take uh, new materials forward to really make a difference in this area? I, mean, I, I, I think it's a very good question, and I think we, we get rather carried away with regulation and, 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 and its complexity. The fact is the organizations like the MHRA are very keen to have a dialogue very early in the, in the day. In fact, the FDA will have it in the minute you, know, you have a good idea, you can start chatting to them about it. So I think we shouldn't see the regulation as a big blocker. Certainly, DH has done a lot of good. I mean, the route map they've put out does look immensely complex at the moment, but I understand it's being... Um, redrawn to make it look somewhat more user-friendly. And so I think that, yes, people are very concerned about regulation, but no, it's not the huge challenge that we make it out to be the, the organisations you can talk to directly. And there are people like Christopher Bravery and others who are, are very capable in the field. So we are now building up the infrastructure for the advice we need. And I think it's actually, I mean, probably TSB would be a good discussion point to bring in at the moment. Um, I, I mean, with regards to... Um the funding that we, we're making available for, for industry, um, part of that and, and part of the design of the programme and the regenerative medicine programme that we're, we're, we're running is to, to um, engage early on with the, with, with the MHRA um, because ultimately the, 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 any projects that we fund will arrive at their doorstep. So what we've asked is, is that companies and um, projects certainly engage with the MHRA at an early stage. And I, I think it is, it is going to be one of these things where um, the, 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 re the regulatory process, the, the, the roadmap is there, but it is about getting some examples of working their way down that. And um, it is a high risk area, it is an expensive area for, for some of the early pathfinders. Um, but that said, I, the, I think it's engaging in the dialogue across the piece. It's making sure that um, we, as the Technology Strategy Board and, 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 and funders of, of the, the, the commercial translation, make sure that the companies also engage with the regulators. Uh, Richard? Yeah, j just one observation on that. I think there is quite a lot of help available for small companies to work their way through the regulatory maze at the moment. Um, what, what I'd point out is that... Um, when you ask a VC why they don't invest in a certain area, they will tell you it's because of something, in this case, regulations. And then if you deal with the regulations, it'll be because there's a lack of adequate production capacity or, or there'll be a lack of something else or a lack of clinical data or whatever. The, the reality is they don't want to invest in this space at the moment because for a variety of reasons they see it as too risky. And the real reason is that nobody else has been there before. They are somewhat sheep-like in their behaviour. That actually if somebody comes in and does something really cool and makes a killing they'll all give up their previous kind of issues that were holding them up at this stage. So be careful about you know, the barrier that the VC says to you is why he's not investing at the moment because you may find it's a hurdle race as opposed to one barrier. <coughs> okay. To answer the question in two ways. <laughs> we understand that RegenMed companies navigate regulations to their advantage. Typically a devices company will look for a CE mark in the UK and then go for a 510K in, yeah. in the US. And that's what US companies do. So you, the, the world is navigated by business to its advantage. But somebody's going to have to talk to the regulator. Somebody's particularly going to have to talk to the UK regulator. These guys are comparatively lean in terms of their resource. And they don't have perhaps the pace that one would expect from an SME. Um, we should encourage national investment in capacity and regulation to assist our companies 
as we said earlier, somebody at the end of the phone who knows what they're talking about has got time to address the comments and issues faced by an SME. It's a capacity problem, not a capability problem. We should encourage increased capacity in the regulator. Okay, we've got, certainly got that down as a bullet point, yes, uh, David. Yes. <laughs> could, could, I, could I just bring into the discussion here Ben Sheridan from BSI? Because um, as a resource and part of that capacity, I think you can offer qu quite a lot, I, I think, in this area. Well, of course, because um, we have um, a standards-making committee in Regen Medicine, um, one of whose purposes is to provide a, a voice for uh, industry and the major stakeholders to tell the regulator what kind of standardised information they would like to see or to, su sorry, <coughs> to suggest to them what it should be in many ways. Um, I go back to what Richard said in his presentation. He, he mentioned something about uh, the engineers need to establish what the critical attributes are um, for the product. Uh, but of course, they've got many audiences for those critical attributes. You, you, you want to control your manufacturing process. You want to... Uh, satisfy the regulator that your product is safe and it works and you also in the UK case want to tell the NHS something um, that convinces them to take it on for a trial or something like that for, or for whatever we want the, the, the clinicians to use this technology for so I think in all these things if we want to make regulation easier if we want to control our manufacturing process if we want to encourage the NHS to take on these technologies we need to establish what these critical attributes are and that requires some kind of standardisation. So I'd be willing to hear comments about what those uh, things should be and also to invite people to come along and join our committee. Okay, so we know we have a resource and an invitation to work with um, BSI. There was one question just around here. Is uh, <coughs> Martin Harris, ex-pharmaceutical um, salesman. Um, Without the benefit of um, clinical trials in vivo, can the panel say with any confidence that uh, regenerative tissue has the same quality and will last as long as those at the beginning of life? For instance, I heard many years ago that uh, stem cells taken from an adult will uh, retain the age of the donor and mature at an accelerated rate. Uh, is, this, is this true? Um, another thing that intrigues me, I would like to see research done on uh, brain cells to treat Alzheimer's and senility. Um, but what puzzles me is if, if brain cells are regenerated, uh, Alzheimer's being a loss of memory, will those regenerated cells retain the memory of the person and therefore the personality? I know okay. it sounds a bit unfair. To, to put that to you. Thank you. I, I, I can very quickly pick up on two of those things. Um, one is we, we don't necessarily need the cells to last the same length of time if one's um, in one's 60s and gets, uh, say, age-related macular degeneration. Provided the cells last another 60 years, I think most of us would be quite happy. Um, the other issue... Um, is that we, we don't know. There is only a limited number of tissue engineered and cell therapy products out there. Something like, something like half a million patients have been treated to date. But what we do know from the clinical trials is that patients who've been treated with tissue engineered skin and get healing, the actual healed wounds in the group that receive tissue engineered skin as opposed to ones that actually heal in the control group is actually much tougher and resistant to breakdown. So the tissue engineered product does give a better result than natural healing. Thank you very much. Right, I think we've got time for one last Sorry, question. If just, anybody, just one Sorry? point. Yeah? Uh, we're working on stem cells for Alzheimer's too. All oh, right, we're, we're, okay. we're using olfactory and sheathing cells, which have certain uh, stem cell-like properties. Uh, so. And do they do they work? <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. One last question. If anybody's got any burning question, I. I want to see. Yes, one last burning question. Well done. So I'll, I'll take the honour of asking the last question then. Actually, I have a comment as well. So it's Tim Allsop from Pfizer Regenerative Medicine. So the comment first is um, I was much inspired actually by comments that Brian made about designing regenerative medicines, and I know then subsequently kind of 
and make comments about the um, relative uh, state of cleanliness of the term design, I guess, in some other comments that he made. But anyway, um, because I think what is out there, if you look at it in a very broad objective sense, is that there are many prototype candidate products which are in desperate need of clinical indications. Um, so it would be, I think, very informative and valuable thinking forward in terms of the evolution of the industry to take a um, product by design approach. My question, however, is to both Brian and Martin, um, is it possible, in a general sense, just to make comment on what the criteria will be in terms of setting the priority indications for the UK? Without giving too much away, but just general <laughs> comments. It, it, it's very easy for me. Um, part of my role is to persuade the, the system, i.e. the NHS, to take this stuff on board in a more willing fa fashion than it has been. So one of the priorities for me will be being able to make a strong business case to the NHS that this will save you money. No, it's an ex extremely good point, and not one, actually, that we're not, not fully developed. There are so many inputs to it, um, and you know the length of time it would take to develop full potential business cases for the various strategies in different diseases. I mean, it's just immense. So, so there will be a degree of suck it and see, I guess. We will take as our out um, at the outset uh, our understanding and experience of what has happened so far, uh, and what cell therapies are uh, seeming to make it through, what the existing playing field is like, uh, and use that as the starting point. Um, and not make too many assumptions about what the playing field is going to be like in the future. So something that we develop that would work using what we know now, the systems that we know now in 2010, um, that's going to be how we will start. So, so could you? Okay. For most that's been developed so far, it's not entirely clear what is an effective dose and how many doses are required actually for defined indications. And in particular, going back to some other points that have been made, how many cells will be required for an effective dose? Yeah, sure. Okay, John, John I think you had a Perhaps just one, one, last, one last comment, actually. Uh, and while the NHS is a unique uh, UK resource to help us go through the development pathway for regenerative medicine, what we should recognise that the real marketplace is the global marketplace and not the NHS as a marketplace. And I guess that should influence our thinking going forward. But, but it's a very valuable starting point, though, I think, the NHS. I mean, it's got to, it's got to be a, a, about, about health and wealth, ultimately. I mean, we've obviously got a UK population which we need to treat and, and, and to you know, pay back the taxpayer, but I would agree with that last comment. It is about creating uh, a sustainable, competitive, new uh, UK healthcare sector, and uh, I think it'll be a combination of the embedded in the NHS and also the, the company focus. Okay. I'm going to say one last... Chris is more or less... <laughs> I think that's a good time to um, wind up.